Boom, what's up fam? Got some big news to share that unfortunately is not so good. So I'm gonna jump right into it. You're gonna watch this video and you're gonna cry. At least we can laugh at your ass as you cry like in, in the corner like a little f***ing girl in the fetal position. You wanna tell me why the majority of people that voted yes I can be submissive are men? Just wanna talk a little bit about why I love women. And the majority that said no are women? I would love y'all to ponder that for a fucking second. I love how you know, they always make sure, by and large, they shower. The feminine energy that that girls put out, it's just, it's magnetic. You think I can be submissive? You fuck I adore it. Seventy nine T twenty four fifty eight learning learning corp little red riding hood take one. What's up, boys? We got Archwinger. What's hey, going good on, morning. brother? Doing All good. Right. I yeah, it's good. Okay, so uh, this is pre-recorded. Hope you guys don't mind, because Saturday morning is a weird time to start a podcast. But at this point, you guys have heard me talk about him a lot. Why don't you give me an introduction? Like, how would you like to have been introduced here? Because I don't have a... Obviously, I would just start referencing your posts. Man, see, I don't like to talk about myself a lot, because, you know, I guess I'm a dude, and um, for about three years, starting 10 years ago till about seven years ago, I pissed a lot of bullshit out of my keyboard onto the internet about women and men and relationships and people like what I had to type. And some way, somehow, I became like an influential, important manosphere figure or something, which is <laughs> bizarre because I am a totally normal, average, you know, I I'm just a dude. Like, I'm some asshole on the internet. So, you know, I'm no better, more capable, or smarter than anyone else. I just happen to be a decent writer, I guess. And here I am. And so, you know, Mr. Stone here, he's been like, quoting my ass on the internet for many years. So I figured I should talk with him at least once, right? So here yeah, I am. That'll be good. I'm actually impressed Torsha managed to bring you out of hiding because you were kind of, I don't know, were you on TRP Red or did you stick around there or not? Because you kind of just fell off the radar after like that seven year moment, like when Jack left and all that. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, you know, I I was like typing on something on the Red Pill one. I was like working on another post and I realized like, you know, I think I've already said this or maybe Whisper said this or, you know, like, like I'm saying the same crap over and over again, you know, and I, you know, I'm busy, like, working on my marriage is about to fail. You know, my wife, first one anyway, turned out to like girls. And so, you know, big story there. But in the end, <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I don't I mean don't to like, laugh. <laughs> no, my life is like an episode of Friends. So, I mean, I married this woman 10 years. I have a six-year-old at the time, you know. And finally, you know, after, like, you know, a 10-year, you know, horrible marriage, it turns out she likes girls. And so, you know, I got the other end of that. And it turns out all this, like, working out and confidence and, like, you know, having game and stuff. That actually works really well when the woman's straight. When a woman does not like penises, it, it does not work very well. So um, <laughs> it turned out maybe my anger at women was misdirected. I should have been angry at women. And there were, you know, the rest of the women are pretty okay. Honestly, the ang I, I'm the, one of the few guys that I get anger when guys have it. Like, we all have it. The part that drives me nuts is obviously it's not helpful. It's not productive. The part that drives me nuts is that people, they assume you have to just stop being angry. They just tell you to quit it. Like, you're a dog misbehaving. I think that's kind of the bad route. And that's why I liked... Uh, what was your post? Remember the women or your men aren't happy? You probably oh, like, do. You wrote the, it. The, the most read it up. Most, I don't remember like nine tenths of what I wrote. This is like, you know, seven to 10 years ago. Oh, well, fair enough. Well, you just reminded everybody. It's like, hey, just so you know, everybody who's here, nobody joins the red pill because their life is perfect. Nobody sits here on the subreddit reading whammon and ain't shit because their wife blows them three days a week. They're here because they're not happy. And everybody else is all freaking out because these guys aren't happy and they just mention something and they're rocking the boat. And I was like, that's the part that got me. I liked it, though, because it kind of explained it for the everyman. That was the part I appreciate the most about yours. You were writing as if it was somebody who wanted to be there but didn't like the branding of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, there's, I, I guess that was my, my gift and the way I wrote most of my posts. is I mean, I'm kind of an old man. I'm in my 40s, you know, so when I write, I'm not like, you know, here's our winner's top 10 list of ways to improve your game. It's like, you know, I, I tell stories and anecdotes, maybe some essays and rants and I mean, at that point, you know, there's a whole lot of material there, and there's a lot of things you might take away from that, and none of those takeaways are wrong. Whatever part speaks to you, whatever's going on in your life, we all have these filters through which we perceive life, and so, you know, I try to include things that will speak to a lot of different people, perhaps for different reasons. Some people would read crap like that, they comment on it, and they would have taken away something that maybe I hadn't even realized or thought about, and I'm like, wow, that's really cool. Yeah, well, even right now, I think out of all the guys that I reference, I think you, Whisper, and Uncle Vaz, I think, are the three big ones. If you guys don't know, those are like 
the most important thought leaders that you've never heard of. And I think Rolo gets fourth place, which is the funniest part to me because he's like clearly the most notable figure. You well, know, Rolo's hard to understand. It's like a whole lexicon of stuff that's just Rolo and his writing is very flowerly. It's, it, it's difficult to parse, you know, whereas like Whisper, you know, he's like pretty more academic than I write, you know, but he has all these kind of genius ideas. And then, you know, Vaz, well, Vaz is like a superhero. He like gets on his private jet, flies to South America, ends up sleeping with like two twenty-year-old you know, waitresses, conducts a multi-million-dollar business deal, flies home to his Scrooge McDuck money vault or something. He's like a wizard, you know. So he's like <laughs> in another league. But the rest of us normal men here, you know, we're just news on the internet. Well, yeah. Oh, but to be fair, the other guy that claims to be a multi-millionaire is going to jail pretty soon here. So, but I mean, that's everybody, dude. Like. I don't know if you know the history, like those little uh, promos that I put before this, the guy with the hat, you probably remember him, Anthony Johnson, but the second one's this guy, Pat Stebner. You ever heard of him? I have not. Dude, he hated you. He hated me. He hated everybody. We were low IQ. He was the typical, like, Jordan Peterson is not your friend kind of guy. And he was telling us, everybody, that we are all uh, evil degenerates, so we're going to ruin the West. And then during January 6th, he went and live streamed going and stomping the, the White House. So he just got uh, he just got charged with insurrection or whatever it was in the states, and he's going to be facing a sentencing in September. So all these guys that have been sitting here telling everybody how horrible the red pill is, he's like the second one to have to go to jail now for doing some dumb shit. I don't know how we ruined the West yet. I haven't been paying attention. Dude, we didn't do anything. I don't. That's what I don't get. It's like you said, we're normal guys, right? It's you don't have to be a millionaire with a Lamborghini to carve out a good life. It's like you said. You know, work out a bit. Not even, not even be shredded. Just don't be fat. Don't be yeah, fat. <laughs> like, like you, you can see me right now. Like I'm a pretty average guy. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not hot. I'm not hideous. Big nose, long face. You know, um, I'm kind of tall and skinny. I'm not buff. I don't turn heads when I walk into the room. I'm probably a pretty average looking guy. You know, I'm a lawyer by day. My life's pretty put together. I make six figures, but a very, very low six figures. So you know, um, that's not a lot of money anymore. It used to be like back when I was a kid, but. You know, it's, it's well above the median. So I guess, you know, I, my professional life is pretty put together. My social skills are a little below average. I talk fast. I have funny inflection in my voice. I make silly faces. Don't care my body well. So, you know, average <laughs> looks. You're really above, selling me on you here. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, I'm, I'm a normal dude. Average looks, slightly below average social skills, slightly above average, like, you know, professional life and smarts. Put those together. I am Mr. Average Dude. Like, yeah. I'm like the guy the red pill is supposed to benefit. Like, you know, so... You're a dude, you, you, you can't get dates, you can't get laid, girls won't talk to you. You need to tweak a few things. Go to the gym, you know, learn a little bit of game, learn how to talk to people without being too weird and awkward, and right. voila. A, an average guy could become slightly better than average, and you two can have sex. Like, um, it pisses me <laughs> off hearing these guys, like, um, like if you're at the top 0.001%, if you're not nine feet tall with He-Man's body and a perfectly squared symmetrical face making a million dollars a second, you will never have sex. Like, that's not true. I mean... You do have to be very, very slightly above average. Like, um, like everyone has to look at you and think he's kind of cute, I guess. That's like the bare minimum looks. Like, if you get the he's kind of hey, cute, it's a foot I guess. In the door. Standard, that, that's it. And from that point, then social interactions can get you to rest of the way. You just have to look about that good and not be a total weirdo when you talk. And you two can have sex. Oh wow! <laughs> when you put it that way, it almost sounds attainable. Oh my god! Although, yeah. And to be fair, it's the part I always hate these arguments because that's the one thing I've noticed being like terminally online about this is that most of the people that are arguing about this are ones who just never get laid and don't even try to get laid it's like the opposite of feminism the incels the parts i like are the married red pill side because that's where that's where i'm running into the 43 year old guys whose wife hasn't slept with them in two months and literally do what's that thing where you sit in the bathroom after your wife shot you down for the 50th time on your phone sitting there like why won't my wife fuck me and then they find your fucking post about uh that's exactly every unhappy wife is a, is a great victim <laughs> I'm like a dude in my 30s. I'm on my toilet. You know, I get my cell phone out. Some of that, like, you know, bad marriage, wife won't fuck me, wife's a super bitch all the time or whatever. And I, I find like, an article that links to the red pill. And I'm I'm reading this article. It's supposed to be making fun of the red pill. And yeah, it yeah. quotes the red pill. And I'm reading the quotes. And the quotes make, make more sense than the article. I'm like, this doesn't sound that radical. And so I navigate all over, start reading the actual red pill. And I'm like, this, these people are, like, speaking what I've been thinking my whole life and never quite made sense. Yeah. Yeah, I enjoyed that. Who was your first one? For me, I think the first guy I read was Wine More Please, if you can believe that. I don't know. I just read everything on the sidebar, like Michael's story and all that or whatever. And then, I don't know, I just read like everything that was on the front page. I didn't really know how to use Reddit that much. I was new to it. Um, read a bunch of stuff from Gay Lou Boy. I thought it was absolutely hilarious. That guy is a funny dude. Oh, dude, he fucking hates me. <laughs> well, he fucking hates me. He would tell you that I am like some degenerate, you know, loser. I mean, number one, I'm Jewish. And number two, you know, oh, like, yeah, I'm not Oh, yeah, that explains it. Yeah, I, I'm not buff. I'm tall and skinny, you know, and I, I don't, 
you know, he, he didn't he go off on some like radical traditionalism bent or something. Yeah, I started going into a Vola and the Ubermensch and that kind of crap. I don't know. It was just weird. I mean, he, is, has some, it's like... it, he has some innovative ideas, though, like equating this, the sexual marketplace to the actual economy. And I'm like, you know, I, now that I've got a little older, I think there's something to that. I mean, like there was a time, you know, when our, our boomer dads could, you know, you know, go you know, pay for a family of four to go on summer vacations, live in a burb on his salary. And now, you know, yeah, yeah. we have this, you know, modern group of guys and their whole life, they're constantly grinding or min-maxing. They're men giving up drinking in droves. Like, you know, it's so culturally ingrained and like, you know, they can't afford it. They don't have the time. They have to have like six side hustles just to pay the rent. And so to be the kind of guy who can compete with girls and, you know, have his life together now, if you've got to grind constantly and have six side hustles, I can see how maybe the sex marketplace and the real marketplace could be connected. Yeah. I mean, I, I get that. I mean, marketplace, all economy, all economics is, is just the, the art, the science of like decision-making, right? It's not so much about money, at least from what I gather on this why It's mostly human behavior. So it makes sense to me. The part that gets me is too many guys love to, to navel gaze about it, you know, where they're always like, Oh, how do I, how do I lay this out? How do I decide which is the way to do it? Not a single guy just takes a snapshot of what it is now and then picks a path forward. And that's kind of the stuff I like the most about yours. Like, you're, I'm going to reference it like 18 times, but your every unhappy wife is a great victim. Yeah, thanks for oh, the yeah. YouTube censors there. That that must be my, my favorite thing I ever pissed on the internet. Because, you know, I don't know. I, I had a knack, I guess, for understanding things from a female point of view. And, I mean, the female psyche is interesting. Like, God, there's so many things, you know, guys like <laughs> rant about women. Like, okay, let's, let's look at men for a second. Like, you're married, right? Yeah. And well, so, a lot, but yeah. I mean, so if you and your wife were having sex once a month, that would be unacceptable, right? Like, I mean, that would be the bare minimum. Like, I think clinically sexless marriage is 10 times a year. Once a month is 12 times a year. So, I mean, like, I mean, that's the bare minimum many guys should be having sex. So, I mean, if you're having sex once a month, your mm -hmm. marriage is circling the drain, life support. It's almost dead. Yeah. Like, if, you're, if you're not married, you have a girlfriend. Well, you know, if you're only having sex with your girlfriend once a month, why the heck do you have a girlfriend? Like, you know, if something's wrong with your relationship. Yeah. So if you're a dude and you're going out, you're trying to pick up girls every weekend, you go out Friday night, Saturday night, like I said, eight times a month, and you're only getting laid one time a month, something's wrong there. Maybe it's your look, maybe it's your game, maybe it's where you're going. You're doing something wrong. In general, if you are a guy, a normal human, and you're having sex only once a month, that's like the bare minimum. If you're having sex less than once a month, there's something abnormal there. I think a normal human probably has sex once a month. And so if we flip that around and look at women now, women having sex is really, really easy. But then, you know, if women, you know, one of the red pill truths, I guess, is women are sexual creatures. Like, they, they actually enjoy sex. It feels good. It's fun. I mean, women like sex, too. I've heard the rumors, yeah. W women will meet a guy <laughs> off of the internet with the understanding they're going to have a casual encounter and never see each other again. They're not trying to, like, you know, con Chad into a relationship. They really just want to have sex. It's fun. It feels good. And yeah. so a woman, you know, why would she have sex less than once a month if once a month is the bare human minimum? So you, you meet a girl, let's say, you know, a girl from age 18 to age 28, 10 years, had sex once a month. That's 120 sexual encounters. Now, obviously, they're not going to be, you know, she's going to have some boyfriends and some consistent casual parts. She's going to have 120 body count. But I mean, 120, and that's just the bare minimum. She only had sex mm -hmm. once a month. So, you know, if you meet a girl, let's say age 28, and her body count is 120, like that's enormous. And you might say, God, women are so slutty. God, why is she doing that? But she didn't have too much sex. She had exactly the right amount of sex, like the bare minimum amount of sex once yeah. a month. Her well, problem I think most guys too... assume it's all like one night stands. It's serial monogamy. They used yeah, to but... sail with chicks that were like that. They had a new boyfriend every month or two. But Great what sex if, life. You know... They were monogamous the whole time. But I mean, you know, notches are getting up there. <laughs> so let's say she has like a, a boyfriend a month or something, you know. So yeah. it's still like a, a body count of, you know, 120 then. So that's enormous. But her problem isn't too much sex. Her problem is not enough boyfriends. Yeah. And so at that point, it's a kind of you look at that problem a little bit differently. Then, like, it's not that she's slutty; it's that why can't after ten years of fucking, she can't keep a boyfriend? Like, what's up with this girl? And it's almost like a, a, a different way to frame the problem. You said something that, that got me onto this. I already forgot what you were saying. What did I just say it now, or was it like a tweet from before? No, it was like you know, like thirty seconds before I started, you know, talking about. You know, oh yeah, the serial like. monogamy. That yeah, it's, I mean, it's 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 not an issue with uh, anything except for they don't know how to lock down a man, or they're afraid to lock down a man, or terrified of getting cheated on and so they kind of break things off early or or they just don't want to be thought of as a slut so it's like i'm in a, i have a relationship i got a boyfriend it's great yeah and but then, then you i know, got a new relationship and a new boyfriend and it's great <laughs> we get this theory about women like you know women are so slutty and degenerate and ruining the west or whatever it is women are doing when really you know 
when a woman's problem isn't too much sex, it's not enough boyfriends, and really it's more of her relationship skills. Maybe women don't know how to be good girlfriends, how to keep guys, and maybe that's the part that's wrong. Like, we go off, like, there's some guys who get these kind of weird biochemical theories where if a woman has sex, it kills her pair bonding ability, but, I mean, the actual act of penetration and orgasm and all that, I mean, there's a little bit there, but I think the idea of getting run through by, like, 120 guys and not being able to keep any of them that's got to get to a woman's psyche, you know? She starts to kind of insulate herself from that, distance herself mm. from the guys, because, I mean, you know, she starts feeling used. She's enjoying the sex, but, you know, she's not really getting true intimacy. And, I don't know, that toll on a female psyche of, you know, sex over and over and never quite, you know, being able to keep a guy, like, that wears on a woman. And that's where we're going with this. By uh, The female psyche, every unhappy wife being a victim, like, you know, yeah, yeah. understand the female psyche, you know, when a woman, like, is having sex she doesn't want to with her husband, when a woman's having sex, she does want to with like, you know, all the, the you know, guys are age 18 and 28, you know, even when there's something missing, the female psyche takes a battering from the whole sex relationship game. I think we don't appreciate so much. I'd agree. I mean, I could see, I see it now. There's people like I've been following old purple pill debate. I don't know if you remember that place. I, you, did you get kicked out too? I got kicked out. They hate me there. They hate me oh. in a lot of places. I, I, maybe that's too interesting for them to kick me out. I don't know. But I just I, yeah. I kind of stopped posting when I stopped posting on Reddit. <laughs> Fair enough. But uh, there was this one girl on there. I'm trying to remember her name. She was like an escort. And then she settled down with like, oh, this is the greatest guy. He's not like the other boys. He's safe. He's got a good job and he's good with kids. And That'd then they worse, were yeah. touting this. Yeah, six months of just like telling it. This is why you red pill guys are wrong. See, it can work. And I remember about six months to a year into their marriage, she cheated on him and they got divorced. And then just like they, they Stalin memory wiped it. And it was just kind of funny. And that's the part that I enjoy because like you talked about things that you saw and you experienced. You had a friend. She wasn't attracted to her husband. He laid an ultimatum and she had like obligated compliance sex, which she did not like. And she wasn't happy. And you kind of know us how that's taps into the same part of the brain as a, uh, as a struggle hugging. <laughs> but it's, it's great because everybody just expa explains what they know from their life. And then other guys will notice it's a very similar thing. Like we're not, like you said, we're all average. Nobody's that different. Our experiences are pretty similar. And so you can't really argue things because 18 guys have like, no, I've had that happen to me. And they're like, well, that's not right. It's like, maybe, but it's still there. And I think we were one, you were one of the better ones at explaining it in, in, a, in an approachable way. Because most of the time, guys, their problems is they don't think. They think they're alone. It's this weird atomization because they don't have dad to talk to and no brother to talk to. You can't talk about sex at the office anymore. You can't talk anywhere. And you so unfortunately, that so, you're I mean... the dad that they never had. <laughs> God, that's yeah, no pressure there. I mean, I already got my own kids. They give me enough of a hassle. I don't need like, you know, internet men. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they're so much worse. So much worse. It's the one thing you'll like is you'll get a stalker at some point. We'll probably have one, like when this releases, uh, if you guys are watching this, we pre-recorded it, but on Saturday, you'll probably see one or two of them in the chat. It's at the point that people know the names of them. But that's, uh, no, I, mean, I mean, it's just... Guys, I, they need role models, apparently. I, they I'm all over this, though. I mean, like, you know, last thing I put on the internet was, like, seven years ago. No one even remembers or cares about me. Like, oh, he's my idol. I'm going to show up at his house demanding advice. Or, you know, oh, my God, he posted bad things about women on the internet seven years ago. i got to find him and get him fired. Like, you know, I mean, nobody cares. It's old stuff now. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, that's that's technically my fault. I'm the only one who keeps referencing you. Although I'm getting Rolo to start referencing you guys more, too, which is nice, because he's got the, the lion's share of men under 25. So it's kind of the people that need to hear this stuff. Because it's not my fault that their dad was kind of weesh. Weesh, isn't that what the kids call it now? Somebody I have is no weesh. idea what the kids call anything. I think we call them being a pussy, but whatever. Yeah, I got, I got a 12-year-old and a 1-year-old. None of them use words like weesh. <laughs> I mean, my 1-year-old said something that sounded kind of like weesh, but I, I don't think that's what he was talking about. All right, fair enough. I've never been good with the lingo. No, I enjoy that. And I enjoyed that stuff. I remember even the beefs used to be better. Like, I know you and One More Please or you and Jack 10 or me and Jack 10 have kind of had it out every once in a while. The part that doesn't happen anymore, and I'm curious what you think of this, is that like back then when we had arguments, yeah, there was egos involved, but it always kind of had that idea of rule zero, like you're there for male sexual strategy. So at least we're all trying to find out who is better at articulating sexual strategy. Nowadays, it just seems more like a, a blood sport way to shame the other guy to losing his brand, you know, sponsorships or whatever. That's like the whole, you know, game on the internet now. But also like we're like dudes in our 40s, not dudes who are 21 or something. So I mean, you know, like, we all know we're ordinary guys. Like, we don't really have mm -hmm. egos and something to prove. Like, I mean, so if I'm wrong on the internet, what the hell does that matter? I'm going to go have sex with my wife tonight, you know? I'm going to go have a few drinks. And, you know, I, <laughs> I, I'm a lawyer with a six-figure salary. I'm okay. Like, I'm going to be fine if I lose an argument on the internet. It's not a big deal. 
Isn't you know, it weird maybe, too? How many? Oh, sorry. Go, go on. Go on. Like you, you learn something from that, even if you don't like, you know, agree with the other guy. Like you kind of refine what you think. Because, I mean, like I said earlier, like everything we say and everything we think is colored by our experiences. Like when I post random crap on the internet and someone, you know, reads, it's not advice. It's it's perspective. I saw something. My experience is filtered a certain way. Here's my perspective on that. And I am not right or wrong or smarter or dumber than anybody else. I just have another perspective and you take that information and do what you want with it. I mean, you may discard it. It may have no place in your life. But I mean, and when you get a bunch of guys on the internet exchanging perspective like that, you know, and there's a lot of information you can incorporate in your life or not. But, you know, we all kind of take and, you know, use pieces of the red pill like that. Yeah. Well, that's the part that's strange now, because I think that mentality is gone. I don't know. Maybe it's just the demographics are different now with what I see, but everybody always wants to be told how to feel about it. So I can't just reference a, an Archwinger tweet or an Archwinger post on, like, what was the other one? Obsessing over a slutty past is indirect pedestal. Assume she's a slut, but don't obsess. I reference that one a lot, too. But, like, that automatically has to come with some moral judgment. And if I don't give it a moral judgment, people will, get, people will actually get mad at me. Like, why aren't you telling me what to feel about this? I don't know. See, I, I would intentionally almost not give advice and just give it an interesting story let people like take some way like, exactly I, I, there's, right there's no right or wrong some guys you know they want to go and they want to have sex with you know 100 women a month and you know like live that life of degenerate hedonism and some guys want to get married and have the 2.5 kids and the white picket fence and <laughs> neither one of those goals are wrong like i mean i don't know if you have like 0. 0.5 kids i don't know what that is i mean you probably want to have three or two not 2.5 uh, it's, but... it's one with downs i think <laughs> something like that <laughs> But I mean, yeah, there's no wrong thing to do in life. Like, I mean, guys have been getting married for a bajillion years. Guys have been having hedonistic lives for a bajillion years. There have been guys have been dying alone in the basement for a bajillion years. And whatever path makes you happy, you should go for that. Yeah, just do it right. Just do it properly. I think that's the, that's the big problem I see now is guys will claim they want one thing and that act reciprocal to that goal. It's, like a good example like... of this was the married guys talking about, I want to be more attractive to their wife, to their wives. And then they act in uh, beta ways again. It's all comfort. It's all making her feel better. It's all that. And they forget at any of like the alpha characteristics or what do we call them? Like being aloof, having yeah. good game, being physically fit. You see the same with like, them. you know, like the red pill hedonist too. Like, you know, they'll, they'll start like acting, they'll, they'll improve their game. They'll start working out. And the very second they get a girl that has sex with them, then they have a girlfriend again. And they're, you know, back in their old ways. And, you know, <laughs> I mean, it happens. I mean, it's not, is it really backsliding? I don't know. I mean, maybe that's what they really want out of life. But I mean, you know, there, there's no wrong way to succeed in life. Like, you know, if you want to go be a married guy who's like, you know, Tim's for his wife and then gets divorced and you'll know, have serial marriages or something like if that's making you happy. That's fine. But I think it's really does a that really of, make anybody happy, though. It's a question of male power. Like, you know, you want to become a good enough and powerful enough guy, enough I don't know, well status looks, whatever you need so that you have the power to choose a path for yourself. And if that path you choose is marriage, if that path you choose is, you know, being a, a big tower or something, that path you choose is being, you know, a hedonist and, you know, more power to you. But it's those guys who, like, I don't, like, if, if I did not have the power to go out and meet girls and hook up and have casual sex, mm -hmm. like, I did not choose, you know, I, I'm not not choosing that. That life has chosen itself away from me. And I get on the internet. I'm all pontificating how superior I am. Like, well, I'm better than those assholes. I'm going to get married and have a family. Well, like, I didn't choose that from a position of power. I had no choice. This was my only opportunity. Like, you almost have to become a guy who has that opportunity to choose, and then you pick the path that's right for you. Like, if life just kind of blows you adrift, you pretend it's what you always wanted to save face, like, you know, you shouldn't be the one dishing that advice. Yeah, well, that was, I think, it was either you or Jack that put it that way. Either, are you living life, or are you letting life happen to you? And I've noticed a lot of guys do the, the latter one. They let life happen, and then the whole purpose of the red pill for them is to find which which story can I use to justify this? Like, uh, yeah, well, for example, the one you're talking about, the guy with a girlfriend only having sex once a month and they just started dating. And I've had guys who did that. And then they're like, well, uh, she's just a practice one. She's where I'm testing all this stuff on before I <laughs> before I get the really good woman. I'm like, what? Why would you practice agree and amplify and amuse mastery on a chick you've been dating for three weeks? It's like, what the hell? And, you know, if she's not having sex with you, I'll, I can already tell you, man, it's not working. Yeah. That's really it. There's always a good excuse. It's always, well, I was hurt before. Well, I want us to be something special. Well, and, and, yeah, I don't do that stuff anymore. It's always the same excuses. I think that's what gets me, too. It's almost like there's some script in the woman's bathroom and they all have to read the same one and use it. Meaningful sex. None of this None of this cheap, degenerate sex that was fun. I, I, I tell my wife today the best thing she ever did was drag my ass home on the first date. Like, if she hadn't done that, I probably wouldn't have taken her seriously.
Oh, really? <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, no, I, mean, women. Ten, I mean, 10 years being married to a lesbian, you know, you kind of want a woman who drags you home on the first date. Fair enough. Honestly, I've seen examples, like I was in the military before this, which I think you know, but um, there was two married guys that were in my department, and both of them had pissed their date's bed on the first date. Like, they just got so pissed drunk, they fooled around, and then they pissed the bed. Well, one pissed and one puked in it. And those people are still together. So I always laugh. I'm like, if these guys, if that girl will stick around for their second date, it's like, how bad do you have to be to not be attractive? It's like, as long as you get, as long as you get her interested in you, you can throw up, you can piss on her sheets. 600 thread count Egyptian cotton. Fuck it. <laughs> if a guy like that can have a successful relationship, what the hell is wrong with you, right? Exactly. That kind of got me thinking, how many guys actually want to win? Or how many guys even want to like have options? I think a lot of guys are, are terrified of it. They well, really I, do. I, like, if, if you though, make I mean, your own like, decisions, then who else is to blame if things go... I mean, they'll blame you anyway. So who cares? The whole pill, though, it exists, like, you know, for average guys. You need a few tweaks to become better. Like, the red pill started out with, like, a bunch of dudes in their 30s who got out of the wrong side of a relationship and started trying to date again and realized, wow, everything I learned in the 90s, get a girlfriend, is not working today. And I had to learn the new rules. But, mm -hmm. you know, it was made for, like, average guys who didn't know the rules or didn't know the game and had to tweak a few things. You know, hit the gym a little more, you know, adjust their game, learn that, oh, my God, casual sex happens. Like, we, you know, early 2000s was, like, I guess when casual sex culture kind of jumped to the forefront. Mm -hmm. But there are some guys, you know, on the internet, like they're complaining the red pill doesn't work at all. And, you know, they might be right. For them, it might not. There are some guys who, God help them, are unfuckable. Like, they're, <laughs> look, look, if you are legit, like you're four foot two and bald, or you are just honest to God, ugly face. I mean, yeah. and there's nothing, there's, there's no amount of working out, there's no amount of game or social skills that will help you. Dating is just not going to be for you. Like, you are a bottom tier guy, and, and the red pill is not going to work for him. Or there are guys who, you know. But how many guys are there like that, really? There, there are some ugly ass guys out there. I mean, if you are average, even slightly below average, you can do the work at the gym, you know, dress better. I mean, there are things you can do, but there are some guys who are like, you know, they're too ugly to fuck. There are some guys who, you know, no, no shade here, but they have mental health issues. Like, not just like a little socially awkward like me, but guys were like, you know, like they'll start talking and like you can tell there's something wrong with them. Like everyone's oh. weirded out by them. And, and, you know, like those calibers of guys, you know, they're bottom tier and they'll go out. And, I've been going to the gym for six months. I've been talking to girls. I can't do anything. It's because you're unfuckable. Like you're like a bottom 20% guy or something. And, you know, uh, I'm Use sorry a corporate about speech. That. Just say it's outside of scope. <laughs> and, you know, red pill, you know, it's not going to help those guys. It's going to help an average guy learn the rules, learn the game and figure out what to do to become a little bit better and kind of optimize his life a little bit. But there are some guys, you know, it's not going to work for them. And there are some guys who are just, I guess, are so good and so naturally don't need it. So it, it's, it's a select, you know, middle tier of guys it's aimed toward. Oh, fair enough. All right, going to do a quick change of pace here. Hold on a sec. Ian, what do... No, Ryan Stone. I see he's the most important guy in the world. Ryan Stone. Give a f about Ryan Stone. Me and him have gone back and forth. Blah, blah, yeah. blah. Ryan Stone does not pass the six foot test. He's not even a man. So I don't give a f about Ryan Stone. <laughs> Two years. I still giggle every time I see that one. All right. So here's, here's my change of pace on this one. You know, like you're talking about the average guy. Absolutely 100% agree. The one thing I loved, you remember Ultimate Cad, right? Or yep. Dentine White or Stacy's Mom Loves Me, whatever he calls himself this week. Nope. Oh, dude. Ultimate I have Cat no idea who's who out there. Like, you know, I, half the time I'm reading words, and I read the words. I don't read who the hell's writing them. Oh, okay. You'll probably remember this one. Alt McCad was the guy who his wife went on a date with an old college guy, lied to him about it. He just assumed she cheated. And then he opened up the relationship on his side and closed on her, started treating her like shit. Uh, there was guys like him and Vaz. I enjoy those guys too. And I remember he put it the best way is why, why a guy who's like attractive and already fucking nonstop would go there. And he goes, I can't brag about this to my friends. They'll get me divorced. I can't talk to my wife about this. I can't brag at work. I can't talk to anybody except for these random internet nerds. Like nowhere else am I allowed to bring up that I'm an actual, I'm an actual cad. And I enjoy that thing too, where all these guys that are just unapologetically have all the options in the world. And literally this misogynistic cesspool full of, full of weirdo internet nerds is the only place where they can like, yeah, I fucked her on the first date. <laughs> There's a whole audience for that, though. The internet rage porn, you know, the guys are like, you don't want to read about girls getting screwed over and stuff, I guess, because I don't know, they, they hate women or hate life or something. I mean, I don't know if that's productive, but it is very entertaining. Yeah, well, I, I like it not because of the, the demeaning part of it, which it's fine. Girls signed up for this. The part I like about it is a lot of guys aren't even aware of what, like, real attraction is. Like, the she pissed in his, he pissed in her bed, and they still, like, they don't even think that could happen. And that's my favorite, because you'll see these stories, and I've seen, like, I've been a sailor for 
12 years, I've seen some shit. I've done some shit. Did and I when you see guys that aren't that? even aware of what a good life of options and abundance means, that you realize how far you've come. Like, they don't even understand it's possible. It's like a but, unicorn. There's a more sinister part of that, though. I think I wrote something to this effect. But, like, um, like you know, they always say, like, you know, like the alpha guys get their sex and the beta guys get their relationships or something. But really, yeah. like, the alpha guys kind of get both. I mean... When a woman is going to, like, have sex with a guy and she doesn't care if she sees him again, it's just fun, like, she's her most uninhibited with him. Her mask yeah. is off. Like, she'll say things to him she will never say to her future husband. She'll do things to him she would never do with her future husband. It's like, things her future husband will never know about. Like, you know, Alpha Chad, she's just hooking up with for tonight. Like, he will know her in a way her future husband will never know her. And that's the real her. That's the her when she's, like, being uninhibited and taking the mask off and not hiding things. And then when she goes on to get married... Her husband will have this carefully curated image of herself she conveys, the masks, the dances, the performances, like, not who she really is. Like, that dude who, like, you know, fucked her when she was 25 off a of Tinder knows her maybe more purely and more truly than her husband ever will. And yeah. It's that's, that's almost kind of sinister. Like, you know, like, your, your wife is just a mask, and, like, all the guys who had her before you, like, in college or something, know the real her. And you, you know, you're getting, like, a performance. And I don't know. That's kind of depressing. Honestly, I... It kind of got me at first. I remember this because I actually wrote in my first book, I wrote this story about this chick, Rose. And I remember this. She was engaged, talking about how great her fiance was. And we were sleeping together 45 minutes later. And that kind of fucked me up. Because it's like it's like you said, there's no pretense whatsoever. It's just pure nothing to gain. This is absolutely fun. It's a potential life-ruining experience. And it's just some guy I barely know. Honestly, I'd say for every guy if you really want to learn about women like getting cheated on anybody can get cheated on but being the cheater or cheat e which one is it you're a lawyer which is the proper verbiage for the guy who's home wrecking i don't know the adulterer maybe i don't know but <laughs> they're they the adulterer like, the adultery partner they call it on like infidelity sites there's like infidelity communities where like they'll talk about like my adultery partner and i did this and that and like apparently it's a thing you know you're oh. intentionally adulterous but fair enough yeah heck but if i know have... But yeah, but that was the point. Like, if it's a girl cheating on you, you can ah dismiss it. Ah, she's just a bitch. Or, you know, with the ex-wife, you can say, oh, she was just a lesbian. In your case, she was. But but you know what I mean? Like, at that point, like, you can't... You got everything. It was all positive. You can't dismiss this as, oh, she was just too stupid to know she was having fun with me. Like, you can't. You have to just sit there and stare at reality in the face. And that's why I kind of enjoyed it. I wish more guys could have that experience. Or at least yeah. be aware that it's a real thing. Until but you, you kind of have to on that side. Actually, like, if you've, until you've actually been the fun guy, the casual sex guy, the guy who's seen a woman uninhibited and realized, holy F, women will actually meet a stranger off of the internet with the understanding that they are just meeting up for casual sex and never see you again. Yeah. And this is a lot more, like, this isn't just a small segment of slutty women. This is, like, a lot of women. Most. And, you know, I'd argue. They're, they're say most women. And, you know, and that's what girls are like. And so your future wife is going to have done that with lots of guys and hide it from you. And like, mm -hmm. this is all women until you've had, until you know what women are really like and had that experience. You're like, you're playing the game with one arm, you know? Yeah. You'll never know when they're, when they're lying to you. You'll never know when they're treating you poorly. You'll never know where uh, she's not actually a virgin. She just doesn't want to feel like a slut with this one that she wants to marry. None of that stuff. Yeah. None of them are virgins, but I mean like, you know, um, yeah, the ability to tell when a woman's lying, that's like a, a well-crafted art there. And some are still really good at it. Like, I, I'm, I'm only like, you know, 40% of the time. That's pretty high. <laughs> Fair enough. Hey, I found your thing, too. It's, uh, I should have put, I got to start putting things in the chat over this. I guess it's, oh, I don't know if it's going to go live or not. I'll do it just in case. Oh, I have to add a destination. It's uh, the women don't just give alpha guys their best sex. They give them their best emotional intimacy, too. Well, it is true. Yeah. And depressing. But see, I don't think it's depressing at all. That's that. I think that's the difference. I've just taken, maybe it's because I've been here for too long, but I kind of take an optimistic attitude about this. It's like, yes, I get it. The rules don't seem fair if you're on the losing side of it, but at the same time, they're consistent. And if they're consistent, you can work with them. Yeah, if well, that's what a girl is like to a guy she's super hot and heavy for, and if you really want to settle down and have a wife, get a girl hot and heavy for you like this guy, then he's in the best position to make the choice whether she's the one to keep or not, you know? I assume perhaps a bit naively so that, you know, when my wife drags my ass home on the first date, we date casually for a while and stuff, and I'm that guy. She tells me yeah. all kinds of crazy shit she would tell Mr. Chad or something, and then I go ahead and marry her anyway. Maybe I'm a dumbass. I don't know. That I mean, the getting married thing, but I've, I've, 
And that's but the that, other you know, thing. Maybe I do kind of know the real her because I was that guy and then, you know, ended up getting married as opposed to being, you know, Mr. You know, get the wool pulled over his eyes, clueless husband who thinks he's marrying an angel or something, you know. But maybe I'm well, naive about all that. Yeah, I think it's the it's the it's the delusion is what gets guys, not the notch count. I know everybody loves to latch on to notch count because as soon as you say that, it's no longer my fault. There's nothing wrong with me. It's her. But arguably for a lot of these guys, and remember Rolo's article, Saving the Best, which is like his most popular one. The guy wasn't mad that she was a whore. Uh, the guy was mad that she wasn't a whore with him. And I think that's what guys are terrified of, the missing out, the having to pay full price for, for half as good a goods. But in the that's... case of like, yeah, the casual sex thing, oh, well, she's not a virgin, that's fine. But guarantee you everything was on the table. So like whatever she used to do, she's still doing with me. And so you don't feel like you're missing out. And that's where I find guys just like, yeah, whatever. Yep. At yeah, that point, they treat it more guys, like she had to get practice. Guys in that situation also get this kind of headspace, I guess, where like, you know, if only I'd met her before my, my wife did all that slutty stuff, it would have been better. But I mean, oh, yeah, <laughs> that's like, that's just putting your own wife on a pedestal as though your wife pre-sex was somehow this like, you know, pedestal worthy woman and your wife post-sex less so like your wife pre-sex was still the same woman she is like, you know, yeah. still the same who would have done that with someone else and not that kind of would have done it with you if you played your cards right. I don't know. Yeah, you would have been one of the chads that never wiped her up anyway, and some other guy be moping about it now. But you know what I mean? It's like they think guys are both impotent and ultimate power at the same time. Like, yes, there's no way in hell you could you could seduce your wife good enough to have her hover her heels for you. But some random dude at Cancun 10 years ago somehow, like, changed her brain chemistry with a power of dick. It's like, come on, bro, pick well, one. Either dick changes girls or it doesn't. It can't well, do both. I'll shout it from the rooftops. Women are sexual creatures. That guy from Cancun wasn't special. She was just horny that night and she wanted to have sex. I mean, if you catch the right woman at the right time and you are at least, he is kind of cute, I guess, good looking enough and not a total social weirdo, you two can have sex. Yeah, you don't even have to be good, just good enough. <laughs> but the standard good enough is and he, available. he's kind of cute, I guess. Just look that good and you're fine. Yeah, it's a, it's a hard one though. I mean, it's easy... Because technically, there's like three different red pills I'm noticing. There's like the Twitter, YouTube red pill, which is all about yelling at whammon, anger face stuff. There's like the the private community uh, red pill, which is a lot of the, like the creators that have kind of done their thing, like guys like you. And then there's the third one, which it's like I have one in my Patreon where a lot of guys are literally just doing the own your shit weeklies from old married red pill days. And they're going from divorced, how can I win my wife back at 40 to like, oh my God, this chick's 23 and she's all over it anal on the first date i didn't know girls did this <laughs> it's like i don't know catholics what do you want me to tell you but it's neat to see like there are there is still like a small sub niche of guys that were doing it like you were back seven years ago where they just figure this stuff out and I, this actually will make you laugh you know the funniest part um i was looking where's your one about the the emotional intimacy we were just talking about there was a guy in specific i don't want to name him but he was describing like, oh my God, I was with this girl and she was just putting it out with me so easy. But then she started opening up in a way that my ex never did. And he was kind of describing your article, but he knew your article, but he just couldn't connect the two dots of his experience and the exact thing you wrote about. I don't know what that is with guys either. They're like they hear all the red pill stuff, but they don't associate it with what they're actually experiencing until, until you kind of point it out to them. I don't know. I found it entertaining. I thought you might too. Like probably unconsciously had that association because, you know, once you read a bunch of red pill stuff, that's, you know, becomes part of your information, your filter. And so his mind then notices we did this and she was opening up with me. Probably had some kind of unconscious association there. I mean, everything, even the, the bullshit we read on the Internet helps color our perception of life. Oh, God, I hope not. Cause I'm, as a masculine man, I'm way too interested in Barbie, if that's true. That's the new thing. Oh, you don't, uh, Barbie, there's a movie coming out yeah, with Margot Robbie. My, my wife and, like, her mom friends want to go see it or something. Apparently, it's supposed to be, like, you know, blonde woman, patriarchy, Ken's a cuck or something. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. I just know it is made to appeal to millennial women. But it turns out every masculine account's talking about how this is the this is the worst thing ever. Although, to be fair, I was joining in on everybody. Every the guy's just calling Margot Robbie a mid. And I guess that got people really mad. The idea that she's not the biggest blonde bombshell pisses women off. Yeah, yeah that, that's that's a weird thing there. I mean, you know, like there's some guys like, oh, she, she's a goddess, and anyone who can't want to admit to it's an incel. And then there's like, you know, like, oh, she's just mid. Her her nose is like one millimeter off center. I wouldn't fuck her. And like <laughs> everything yeah. in between. I mean, she's an attractive woman. I don't know. Maybe it's not everyone's thing. I mean, I prefer brunettes. But I mean, you know what? I mean, I don't know what the big deal is. Well, I know for guys, the pissing thing, like they think the idea is 
you got to take women off their pedestal. If you got to be mean to them, otherwise they're going to be too entitled, which whatever. Good luck with that. <laughs> Thirst always wins in the end. But for girls, a lot of it was if uh, if you call a girl that they think is prettier than them average, then it you're basically saying everybody else is ugly. And I think that's why they were losing it on that one. But that's because guys don't understand solipsism. You know, the idea that everything a girl hears and says is filtered through the 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 me 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 filter as if she's yeah. the center of the universe. Yeah, I always say you know like um that that's probably the biggest difference between men and women is that men I guess we're so used to being I don't know the, the workhorse the disposable sex the cog in the machinery we yeah. recognize that we are ordinary people we are a a side part in the universe's story a woman can't accept that she's like you know just a two bit role in the universe's story she thinks it's her story and the entire universe is like you know a side role in it like she's the main character. What do they call that? Main character syndrome or something like that? All right. So the whole story is about her. and It's all like how it fits into her story. And, you know, I don't know. Men are just having an easier time being more comfortable accepting being, you know, just a bit part in the story of the universe. We're okay with that. We're going to make whatever mark we make, enjoy life and die. And, you know, I don't know why it's harder for women to expect. expect. I don't know if it's like a, a learned thing or a hardwired thing, but it's, it seems easier for men to accept that. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's learned or if it's nature or nurture. It's here, right? You can work around it. Yeah, I guess the working around it is the key part. I mean, it, it is here, but, you know, if you can get a woman Navigate a little more it. comfortable with, with, with mere existence. Yeah. So here's my question for you, too. And this is one I kind of know the answer to, it, but I'm curious of your thoughts. I remember back in the day, oh, I guess I won't even mention the names you won't know, but like S-Curve Much, Rule Zero Dad. There was like an exorbitant amount of lawyers, doctors, and military guys in the Married Red Pill. Like almost 80% of them were one of those three occupations with like occasionally a cop instead of the military guy. Why do you think that is? Think about the rules. Like what, what do we think the rules were before the red pill? You go to, you know, you work hard in school, you go to college, you know, make good grades, get a good degree, yeah. go out, get a job, get a good salary. That way you can afford a house in the burbs, an SUV. And now finally you're going to be attracted to women. You go out and you, you meet women, you buy them flowers, you take them on three to six days before you have sex. You have to have a lot of common interests and talk about your feelings. And then you end up getting married at a certain age you're supposed to. And so you end up married to a woman, you know, who maybe wasn't the right woman to marry. Like, you know, you just you were at the right time in your life. You went through all those motions and you were playing by the old game under the old rules. Now, here you are in a marriage with, you know, a woman who's not happy, not fucking you, you know, most of us there for the paycheck, maybe not consciously. Maybe she had every intention of things working. But then, you know, here you are in the classic, you know, I need to you know, go on marry, red pill, invent marriage. And I say end up there. And I see a lot of doctors and lawyers ending up that way. And. Military men maybe don't have the bigger salary, but they had the same ideology of I'm going to do the work. I'm going to go through the paces. I'm going to build a good life, you know, become the kind of guy who can, I guess, earn a family. I almost feel like you have to earn it rather than just, you know, the family earns you. And Oh, my God. Yeah. Like it's like it's buying your first car, your first instant family. <laughs> yeah. And so a lot of guys feel like almost like, you know, that, that wife, that kids, that family, so they have to earn and be worthy of. And so they, they're doing all the work and following the old rules when, you know, I mean. I don't know, like, you know, I did the wrong thing going to law school even. Like, you know, I studied hard in school. I got my degree. I went to law school, got my degree. I got my master's of laws and, you know, worked my way up through several law firms. And now I work at a law firm from some other guy. And I make, you know, barely six figures. And it's enough to barely make the mortgage most months, you know, when we don't have to buy too many groceries or fix any things. Inflation sucks ass. And then, you know, <laughs> I, I live in a neighborhood, you know, with guys who, like, you know, I don't, I'm not sure what they do. They like, they sell stuff or stuff, but they just, they, they, they manage accounts. And like, so they're on the phone like a few hours a week and that's all they do. And like, they make twice as much money in me and they're out like on, you know, playing ball with junior on the lawn or something. And like, you know, so like following the path you're supposed to of like, you know, four year college, get a degree, job for a good company and now you can earn a woman. Like in a lot of ways, we've been kind of sold on the, the bad path. The right path is like make a bajillion dollars in Bitcoin or something, move to Costa Rica. Like, you know, the path we were trying to follow as kids may not be the best path. Dude, actually, now that you mentioned that, I was thinking. So psychiatrist, we've had our fair share of psychiatrists try and come in this space and join in on the on the fun. This one I'm remembering, and I'm not talking shade on him, Dr. Sean Smith. And it's funny because it's like you said, he had to go to medical school eight years, get a shrink degree. They get a practice where you can charge like $100 an hour for talk therapy, maybe drugs or whatever. And then you'll see guys like this guy, MLD John, which I don't know if you know who he is. He dressed up like Sergeant Slaughter talking about his workout program and that making 10 times the amount by giving very boilerplate first year psychology experience. And it's, it resonates more with men. It's more helpful. Like obviously the more hardcore psychological or legal, like you don't use the top tier legal stuff you learned. You're probably doing for the most part, very 
basic legal stuff with the occasional rare, you know, thing that really requires like 110% for you, am I right? If I'm ever in a courtroom, I'm being sued. I'm going to need a good lawyer. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, and so they see this, and so it builds a lot of a lot of professional jealousy. Because they're like, "Damn it, did I just waste my life?" It's almost like getting zeroed out with the the wife you thought you earned, and then she decides just to sleep with somebody. And so I find the professional attitude of this is crazy too, because a lot of the a lot of shrinks are trying this. And then fortunately, what's the biggest quote? You ever? I don't know if you ever heard this, but they say you just need to find a masculine therapist. And I always laugh at that because it's like so like. If I go to the doctor and it's not a masculine doctor, I still expect the surgery to go well. Like there's a baseline level of care. So I mean, why do I need the adjective? And then my question is, well, if you need the adjective, why do you need the shrink? Why do you need the noun? Like, why do I need a shrink? Wasn't just a masculine anybody good enough? But I was like, imagine like a female telling urologist, you that. I don't yeah. know, a female urologist. Like one has a little weird, the other, I mean, her, her fingers are a little smaller, so it might be less uncomfortable. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Either a pygmy or a small Asian urologist is perfect. That would be, you know, an Asian woman, you know, she's not going to get like too weird about it. Like, you know, I mean, like a 22 year old, you know, like white girl fresh out of college or something, if you're a urologist assistant or something, that'd be a little weird. But like, you know, yeah, I think it's like a small Asian urologist. Uh, you know what? Most of my, all my sisters are all horse girls. So I've seen them have to stick a hand up a horse's ass. I've just, girls just seem to don't have that same disgust reflex guys do. Oh, that's checking pregnancy for cattle and, and horses, by the way. That's why you have to you have these big gloves that come up to about here and you just got to get in there and check so just one guy I, I think his rule was um he doesn't date nurses because nurses you know they do see a lot of stuff so they have like no disgust reflex so they've done too much raunchy shit with too many guys oh dude it's yeah no disgust reflex insane work hours so they got a very work hard play hard atmosphere like when there was always the nurses ball in Victor victoria bc where i was where i was stationed and when the sailors and the nurses got into a party together it was like it was horrible i mean it was great but yeah, I'm I'm kind of with you. I can see not wanting to marry nurses that way. Yeah, but, but technically, whole, like, they're the they're the group of women that have the most infidelity out of any profession. I can who'd see have, that. Known? No, I mean, I'm, I, a psychiatrist coming in this space though, and like trying to like do some good or something. It's always seemed really silly to me trying to like monetize the manosphere. Because number one, the kind of guys who have like poor social skills and can't get laid tend to also underachieve professionally. So yeah. I mean, it's like to have like piles and piles of disposable income. And then, you know, like, I mean, all, the whole medium, like, you, you post a YouTube video, if it gets, like, a, a million hits, YouTube keeps all the money. You get 17 bucks. You can go, like, buy beer or something. Like, you know, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a labor of love. This isn't, like, some cash cow here. Like, a psychiatrist come in deciding to try to, like, build a practice on men or something. That's not going to work out. Oh, well, dude, you've missed out. Uh, that's apparently it's the the biggest channel right now for, like, the Manosphere is one called Fresh and Fit. I don't know if you ever heard of it. Oh, yeah, it's like just dudes who, like, have women on. Like, they all, like, act like morons or something, aren't they? Yeah, so Rolo found this one guy, Myron, and he he essentially, he helped him out to give him, like, a little bit of credibility. And now he just yells at women about how to be, you know, how to not be a whore, how to be traditional, go put on your sun hat and summer dress. And the big joke is he feeds them white claws, gets them drunk, then kicks them off the podcast. Makes huge bank. And then uh, this other one, Pearly, she's kind of like the equivalent of, I don't know if you remember Karen Strawn back in the day. Oh, yeah, I made a mistake of following someone close to Pearl on Twitter, and now I get, like, 60,000 Pearl tweets a day. I just I ignore most of them. Yeah, it's the girl basically giving the whole uh, men's rights. Like, I understand, fellas. But it's, like, very monetizable. But that's the problem, is that the monetizable parts are the most emotional parts. So, like, anger phase, absolutely, and sympathetic, approachable, like, attainable woman. Those are the two big ones that go. And then there's that other guy, Tate, who I just had the thing on. But, uh... You know what? I'll rant. You don't want me ranting about this stuff at this point. I'm just going to call them fucking morons. But here, back to the science. We're going to do a quick break. I've talked to Ryan Stone once. I'm pretty sure the whole conversation, I pushed him like pretty hard. What was hard, Ariel? <laughs> the therapist will essentially give them SSRIs, which I think you know, like you know the, the sexual effects that SSRIs have on the body, right? That's uh, some. Like yeah. there's tons of like MAOs and like tricyclics that you're talking about, like the, the type of SSRIs that you speak in the pedophiles. We don't give those to men. We don't give those to men. We don't give those to men. But he's not as informed as like I think oh. he would like to be. Yeah. <laughs> It, it was supposed to be like a good segue from, I can't believe psychiatrists and therapists would be trying to get into this space. <laughs> those, those, that's the grad student power hour, that one there. Man, I feel so prof Your show has like commercials and everything, man. It's like a yeah, professional well, podcast. It, you know what it was? It's, um, I found out there was a lot, like, I just stick to red pill stuff. For the most part, I'm almost just can't cultural anthropology. Like, this is what we did 10 years ago. And that's a majority of my content. And a lot of people got very angry at it. So somebody gave me the bright idea. Well, like, well, if you're getting all these 
people that everybody knows on the internet hating you. Why don't you just make commercials out of it? I'm like, sounds good. So I've got like 20 of those now. <laughs> like Matt Walsh from Daily Wire making fun of me for not having a dad or something like that. It's just, why not have some fun with it, right? If you're going to talk about irreverence against women, why not have irreverence against goofy dudes online? So, I mean, yeah, you're not making a bajillion dollars doing this crap on the Red Pill, Dan. Like, um, you have a fun day job? No, no, this is it now. Honestly, it's been uh for the past five, six years. But it's not like the YouTube and the yelling at whammon stuff. For the most part, I'm also writing books. Like I, my goal right now is to finally finish the book that I wish the Blue Pill Professor wrote on Dread. And it's getting there. It'll probably be done before end of year. It's my third one now. And the YouTube stuff is for the most part marketing and advertising for it. So it is still a labor of love. It makes no money, not really. But everything else I do makes a pretty decent living. But it's like you said with the guys that did the crypto thing and this, I just military pension make a good enough income, you know, working couple. How much money do I really need to be happy? Yeah, I could make a little more, but, you know, just about six figures is good enough for me, even in even in the Toronto housing market. So I tell the wife, you know, like maybe, you know, the, the go to college, go to grad school, you know, also you can work 16 hours a day and never quite have enough money to make rent. Like, are we happy? Maybe like our son, you know, should be running around on the beach learning how to fish or something. We should go expat or something and just not put him on that path. Like worry about what preschool to send him to. They'll put him on the college track. Like maybe that's not the path to happiness. I don't know. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. Like you have to have some kind of a, some measure of, of self-determination or mental point of origin to even ask those questions, let alone have a good answer for him because it's risky. Like just the lawyer degree, for example, that's six, eight years of your life dedicated to being competent professional at this thing. For you to make the choice, let's say you wanted to leave it, ah, I'm going to just sell Bitcoin and do this, or I'm going to make a YouTube channel about, you know, carpentry or whatever. And it might make more money, but you're asking, you're basically having to come to terms with, well, is that eight years of my life? Am I willing to throw that away or would I want to not give that up? Now for me, I gave it up. I'm like, ah, whatever. It's military. I was like, fuck it. I'm out. Corporate stuff. I hated traffic. So I'm like, I'm out. And then I'm stuck in here. Law school plus, you know, just having a good linguistic aptitude. Like I was, you know, thinking if I didn't have to do my day job, I'd probably, you know, meditate in the beach every morning and be a writer or something. And not, not stupid manosphere stuff. There's like no market for that. Like a bunch of angry men. I just like write fiction or something. You could. I mean, there's nothing stopping anybody. Although to be fair, once I wrote my first book, I've, I've met everybody you meet now will tell you about the book that they never finished. So just by, so don't worry about making a good book. If you ever do, just finish it. Apparently that's the one thing that'll get you past 80% of your competition. Most men just don't, don't finish what they start. Mm. Well, it's hard. I mean, when you have a day job, you're working 16 hours a day, plus a side hustle and you have a family and stuff. Find a spare time, like, you know, do something, a massive undertaking, like writing a book or something, you know, that is a real pain in the ass. Like, well, yeah, yeah. People, everyone wants to start a book, you know, and then they never finish because life happens, you know, life's hard. Well, that's the, that's the, that's how preferences play out, right? They've made their decision on what they want to spend their time on. So it wasn't the book in that case, or it wasn't this and it wasn't that. I think that's another thing about guys that I'm noticing is difficult is um, they, they've they already made decisions of what it is they value in their life, but they keep thinking about the other things that they didn't choose to do. You know what I mean? I can see that. Yeah. I mean, you know, every choice or even when you don't make a choice, you're making a choice. I mean, you know, just every road not taking could have been better. Grass is always greener. Yeah, but I mean, just the, not even so much that part of it, because that it's easy enough. I always take the adage of, uh, I, I must have known what I was doing when I made this decision, so I'm going to ride it through until I got a reason, until I got something better. But guys, just unwilling to accept that the decisions they make are the things that they actually wanted, right? I think was it you? No, it was it was uh, Jack Ten of Hearts who did that, where he talked about dread and in response to all these guys like hating women and stuff in the married side. And he goes, look, guys wouldn't be here if deep down they didn't love their wife and just wanted her to love them back. And so you just have to accept that that's why you're here. The whole, you know, fuck these bitches is just about getting it out of your system. But ultimately, it's just because you want somebody else to appreciate you for what you do. And I think a lot of guys, yeah, they're, they're, they don't like admitting that to themselves. The idea that I like my wife and I want to be happy with her. Because, you know, that'll make you sound like you're gay. Everybody will make fun of you. I mean, you or it's possible she won't love you back and then that'll hurt. You can't be that angry with someone without, you know, caring about them and caring what they think. I mean, you know, these guys are like, well, I, I, everything comes from inside. I don't have any external sources of validation. Like, no, yes. dude. I mean, like, if, if women don't want to have sex with you, that affects you. You know, same yeah. way, like, if people don't want to hire you or, you know, patronize your business, like, like if, or to be your friend. Like, if other people external to you don't like you, this affects your life very severely. Like, you know, with other people, what, what is this world even about? 
Exactly. What's the opposite of love? It's not hate. It's apathy. And that's what always yeah. makes me. That's what hurts the most because you see the like you see a lot of guys' anger phase, and they're getting it stoked so much now by stuff on YouTube. It's just they're but, furious at women. And you're I understand okay, the anger though. I mean, like yeah. I mean, these are these aren't bad men. I mean, they they're they're doing a few things suboptimally about life, but generally they are good people. They're not too hideous, you know. They yeah. they work hard. They they're nice to their spouses. They you know they go to work every day. They they're generally nice to everyone else. They're not bad people. They're making their mark, however small it is, making the world a better place, and they, they don't deserve to be in a shit marriage and never have sex with a wife who's a super bitch all the time. Like, it's not fair. They don't deserve that, but here they are in that boat. I can understand getting yeah. angry. Of course they're angry. Well, that's why I like uh, that's why I like your work in, a, in specific, because everybody else tells those guys that you shouldn't be angry. Everybody else is happy. Why are you complaining? And, like, I can't think of anything that's more dismissive of somebody's humanity than telling them what they're going through doesn't matter. Yeah, and you're like, that, like I said, you're that first, you're that entry gateway drug where it's like, wait a minute, he's pissed off at his wife too. I'm pissed off at my wife. The number and one way to piss a woman off is like to invalidate her feelings. I mean, why are our feelings any less valid? Of course you're angry because, you know, bad shit's happening in your life that you don't deserve. You're generally a good person and you don't deserve to have a bad marriage. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of guys too, once they realize that once they take deserve out of the equation, it's just a consequence. You know what I mean? As opposed to, okay, so the, why doesn't the wife want to fuck me? It's because I don't act attractive, or it's because she's been cheating on me and doesn't respect me and gets down. Like, well, there's, there's a hundred Sometimes it's not even a consequence, why. though. Like, I mean, if I had done this differently, my marriage would be better. Or, or not. It's not your fault. What you did was perfectly reasonable, and you still ended up in a bad marriage. And, you know, I mean, it's like not, you know, not everything was within your control. You could have done yeah. everything right and still ended up in a bad marriage. Like, it's not oh, like I'm not saying, fault. like, every consequence is under your control, but it is still a consequence. Like, I, I don't want to personalize it to you, but it's like, yeah... Found out my girl likes girls. Like, there's a consequence to that. Although there was no way you could have known, as far as I can tell. Looking back, though, there, there were probably some signs, you know. I mean, <laughs> you, you, don't, you don't recognize them at the time. But looking back, I'm like, oh, that, that makes more sense now. But, like, a better example was that guy with the red hat I put on the first ad. His name is Anthony Johnson. And he came into the married red pill for a while there with his marrying Medusa thing, where he married a chick who found out was a prostitute. And then you see videos of her. And... Like, in your head, picture a red-headed prostitute. That's what she looks like. And so everybody kind of looked at him as going, really, dude? Like, you weren't expecting that <laughs> out of all the things. Like, the, you know, the cheap boob daub where it's like the scars are underneath the nipple, like all that stuff. And you're like, holy Jesus. And a lot of guys just are, like, I'm not referring to even us. I'm referring to the average guy that's completely clueless. Like, they don't even understand what the consequences are of any action. So when they're making stuff, it's just guesswork. And the best they got to go on is while well, the girls in their life that are telling them absolutely the wrong information. It's like, yeah, buy her flowers, bro. That'll win her heart. And it's like, no, I don't think it will. Well, you should see a marriage counselor. I think it was, wasn't it you where you equated marriage counseling to 17th century medicine? I think that was yours. Oh, that God, was I want me. to look at this one. But the, does that yeah, sound you, familiar? Not, it does not. But yeah, I mean, marriage counseling is like, you know, the therapist and the wife kind of tag teaming you about all the things you have to change and do better. And you change them all and your wife hates you even more. Like yeah. people all like, I was like, I think it's like 80% of the time, a husband and wife have a big fight after therapy on the way on the drive home. Like, you know, it's some. <laughs> I didn't know you about that. That's funny. Really? Like, well, yeah, because there's all these issues, you know, it's like, and the wife's like, and you didn't change this or do this. And I remember this from last session. It's always like, you know, the therapist and the wife tag teaming, you know, now, now, husband, you got to change this and work on this. And nine times out of 10, the husband's already doing the laundry and spending time with the kid and cooking. And it's still not making her happy because the core problem is she's not attracted to it. Yeah. Like a lot of guys miss that one, too. Actually, it's funny you mentioned that. We had uh, a little while back, one of those guys, one of those Gottman qualified marriage counselors. And he was talking about the reason that marriage counselors always help the girl tag team on a guy. It's it's check it's technically a business decision. Because if you tell a girl she needs to make all these changes, girls don't try to make the changes to save the marriage. They fire that guy and look for a tell them that they're right and he's wrong. Like they're looking for the pylon. And guys generally don't want to go to marriage counselors anyway. So the marriage counselors that tend to do better are the ones that accommodate that feminine perspective. And the ones that I don't that. tend to lose tend to lose business or switch trades or whatever. It's just kind of funny how it's gets taken over by women for a female purpose and it doesn't work for men at all. Yeah. Most marriage therapists don't give good advice to save the marriage anyway. So, you know, I mean, if you're, if your wife drives to therapy, then you're already circling a drain. It's time to start getting your ducks in a row. Start talking. That's your, that's your signal. Start talking yeah. to a lawyer now and figuring out your options. Like, you know, like, like go to counseling, put up, put up a good chunk, but start going to your lawyer now and get your ducks in a row. 
Yeah, well, isn't that the, the one meme about that, too, is a lot of girls, the only reason they're seeing marriage counselors, too, is because that's a legal requirement in their state for separation, and they want to have the, well, we tried everything, and it still didn't work. So, like, they're the blameless in every in situation. State, yeah, I would be surprised that's a law somewhere. I mean, most states just have no-fault divorce any time for no reason, as long as I, most states, if the woman's pregnant at the time, you can't get the divorce for any other situation. Oh, I didn't know that. So you can't well, divorce a pregnant, pregnant woman in most states. Like, once she has the baby, you can divorce her, but, yeah, not while she's pregnant. So, like, can she divorce you when she's pregnant or no? Well, I don't know if they'll process the divorce. I, mean, I guess if she probably has to get, like, a, you know, some kind of special, like if she claims abuse or something maybe. But, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of, you know, funny, archaic laws like that. Well, that's interesting. I always find that so fascinating about American law. Like, it's common law, same as up here in Canada, but it's not at the same time. Like, all the stuff here that we know is different. Like, here... We have common law marriage, which is just you cohabitate for two years. It used to be six months, but now it's two years. They just, all things considered, they're just like assuming you're married. But in the States, you guys didn't have that. Because I guess dudes were common law marrying each other and filing the tax benefits. So like it all comes down to money, I guess, over there. Maybe. I didn't hear about that. But yeah, I mean, if you think about historically what marriage was supposed to do, I mean, I mean way historically it was like uniting families and like, you know, preserving wealth. But I mean, like mm -hmm. more recent history, it was mostly just to give women essentially insurance so they can't get saddled with kids and then abandoned and have nothing to live on and the kids die. And that was like the original purpose of marriage. And, you know, now in modern days, we have the, the no fault divorce. Women have jobs anyway. And, you know, so I don't know if the, the same archaic purposes of marriage hold true or not. I mean, we, as a society, we don't want the guys to marry women, saddle them with kids, and then abandon them and the kids starve to death. We don't want that. Yeah. So, I but mean, do we even have, like, when was the last time that's happened, though? Well, I mean, usually, you know, I mean, they, they you know, chase dad down for child support, but we have, like, dads who are deadbeats or dads who are too freaking poor to pay enough to support all the kids they've had. I mean, at that point, then you have, you know, state dollars step in. So, I mean, there's a safety net in place. So, yeah, yeah maybe marriage is outdated. Maybe now the state's taking over that role. I don't know. That's why I think I argue with Aaron Clary about this a lot. And he always just tells guys, don't get married. And I'm kind of with you where I'm like, I don't think that's the right message because telling a guy what to do, it's kind of antithetical to what we're doing here. I much prefer the way guys like you or me or Whisper or Whisper would put it. Just don't like marriage is a bad deal for men. I'm not saying don't do it. It's still up to you, but you at least understand going in what's in it for you, right? My dumb ass got married a second time, but I mean, why? I wanted another kid. I always wanted two with the first wife, and you know, that didn't work out. The first baby, like, broke my first wife, man. Um, it was not good, like a bunch of postpartum and stuff. And then, um, it was one night, man, like, um, the baby woke up crying. I am bleary eyed. I've, like, you know, gone and, like, dealt with her, like, the last three or four times. And she goes yeah. in, and, like, give her a bottle. The baby will not stop crying. It's got, like, ear infections, colic. It was a rough first year of life for our daughter. Right, and, right. Um, I hear my wife, like, cussing at her, calling her a stupid shit and stuff. And, I go into the bedroom, I put my hand on her shoulder, and I'm like, I'm benching him, get some sleep. And my wife never did night duty after that. Every night I would drag the couch cushion from the game room into the, my daughter's room, put it on her floor, plug my cell phone in, get like, you know, freezer pouch, bottle, antibiotic, bottle, Motrin, bottle, Tylenol. Every time she woke up, I'd check my cell phone, see what time it is, what meds I could give her, rock her back to sleep, and that was like every night for her first year of life, and, you know. So my wife did not want a second kid, perhaps understandably so. It was, um, was kind of rough on her, but I always wanted two, like three of two turned out to be easy. Well, I mean, was it that rough on her? You seem to manage it. Hell yeah, I, I guess I'm just tougher than she is, and you know. <laughs> just fucking whamming, can't handle nothing. <laughs> can't even handle motherhood. I mean, I, I, I was a better mother than she was, but yeah, so. But yeah, after that, she'd want a second kid, and that was probably the right decision for her, but I always wanted two, and so I'm dating this woman, and she's pretty awesome. She's like eight years younger than I am, and she wants kids more than anything, and you know, I'm like, you know, I always wanted a second kid, and this woman's actually good to me. She's good with my daughter. She makes her house a home. You know, like, I know marriage is a bad deal, but if I want another kid, I don't want to have another kid out of marriage. That's stupid. Right. So, you know, here we are, and we have a 14-month-old now, and he's freaking awesome. He's exhausting, but he's awesome. No colic, no nothing? Perfect. Oh, he is a chill baby. He's amazing. You know what's funny, too? Uh, from my experience now, though, I've probably been through, like, three, 400 guys talking about this. The top three problems married guys have that will find their way to our little doorstep is, like, like wife not having sex, um, I can't get laid, and then like single guys who can't get laid. And the third one is I need to get my wife to stop yelling at the kids. That one, so common. I didn't even know it was this common. Like I remember there was the only, I've heard about colic babies like once or twice. I thought it was like cancer where everybody kind of knows it exists, but you don't know anybody who has it, or like or smokers or whatever. But yeah, apparently that story 
if you wanted to do Archwinger 2.0, just bring it up, dealing with a wife who who acts like she can't stand her kids would be like the most resonant thing for married guys now. I mean, it's one thing to have like a four-year-old who's breaking all your dishes and stuff because he's got like, you know, all kinds of issues that are common to four-year-old kids nowadays. But I mean, mm-hmm. when you have a baby who's like, you know, crying because it is a baby and, you know, it's uncomfortable, doesn't know what to do. Like you can't you know, yell and cuss at a baby, but like, yeah, oh. your toddlers, yeah, discipline the shit out of your toddlers. They need to learn better. <laughs> Just shake them. No, don't do that. Please don't do that, people. <laughs> I got to okay. be careful. It's the internet. Two things you never shake are babies and whiskey drinks. <laughs> But yeah, but a lot of guys don't know how to handle that because they've always thought of men and women as equal. And in the relationship, what to do they is think it, they have to negotiate. If they shake your Manhattan, you you tell them that you want another one and you don't want them to shake it. It's like, you know, you, that, that's how you handle that problem. <laughs> I always liked Manhattans. They're the one drink that a guy can have with a cherry in it that doesn't make you feel like a fairy. Yeah, that is true. But, it, you know, it's not about the cherry, though. You know, you want to get a good rye, you know, and the sweet oh, yeah, vermouth like the, the grown-up simple syrup. Like simple syrup, you want to have a Manhattan's grown-up. You have a sweet vermouth, a fortified wine, and then, you know, and you want, like, just diluted by stirring, not by shaking. If there's bubbles in your whiskey drink, send it back. And the cherry is just there, like, to soak up the rye while, you know, you're having your drink chatting with someone. Like, yeah, it's the guy's yeah, drink. It's, booze mixed with more booze. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's almost more like, you know, the, the aromatics as opposed to, like, the sours. Like, those are more guy drinks. I mean, like James Bond, like, popularized the martini. Now the martini is almost more of a girl drink. But, you know, like, it was originally a guy drink. A vodka martini dry. He, if it's a shake of martini, though, you need to get that dilution or it tastes too much like vodka. Yeah. Plus, when you get, it, like, really cold, like, little ice chips in there when you're taking a sip, that's pretty awesome. For me, my big one was my dad got me on them. Gibson's. You ever had one of those? I think so. It, but... It's a martini, but it uses the pickled onions as opposed to the, the olives. I don't know. It's it's good. It's weird. I think it is because in Canada we have these drinks called Caesars. It's like a Bloody Mary, but it's with clamato instead of uh, instead of tomato juice, and they just have that. that pickled thing. I think it's because we have like a giant Ukrainian Polish community in Alberta where I was from. But uh, Gibson's just straight up done like you know vodka vermouth and then you know shake and then the pickled onions. Yeah, just use well, the pickled onions instead of the olives. I mean, you know, if you change a martini garnish, like, you know, we'd stuff our olives with blue cheese or something, you know, and, you know, you can put whatever you want in a martini. So why why not, you know, an onion and call it a Gibson? All right. Fair enough. Okay. I'm going to do a quick another break here and we'll segue into part three. Since there is no ultimate good to defer to, you have to know what you want so that you can ask yourself the right questions. You know what? I'm going to make fun of one more person. Where's, where's somebody else we can poke fun at? Oh, yeah, this chick. Sounds very paranoid to me. Like, still read is quite paranoid to me. But it does, it screams a little bit of somebody who is very paranoid on anyone. I think it's, I, I do think there's an element of um, suspicion. Like, if, if you are feeling a certain level of vulnerability, that I think this guy definitely is. So that chick, her name is Emily. She also hates me. She hates everything I stand for. She was repeat. She was quoting this guy, Rich Cooper, who's in there, a buddy of mine. He was talking about the zombie test with women. Like you on a date, you just ask them, like, what would you do in the zombie apocalypse? And if their answer was anything other than help you load ammo, you know, fill up your mags while you're shooting. She's like, she's not the one. And it was just like supposed like a fun thing to talk about on a date, right? Like, you know, hand palm reading or use the cube, whatever. And she turned into this long diatribe about men being insecure. And it was like the funniest thing ever. And so I wanted to have her on for a thing. And she's like, no, I can't stand you. You're a misogynist asshole. I was like, all right, fair enough. Advertisement it is. But like, this is the other people. This is everybody else who's throwing things out there other than Archwinger articles or Wine More Please articles. It's it's people like that. What do people hate about you so much, though? Like just saying, you know, I know you're a dude. You happen to have a penis, but like your feelings matter too. And you're also an equal part of your relationship. And so you also should get what you want out of life. Like what's so hateful about that? Well, that's just it. And that's a whisper reference on that one. Like, yes, Virginia, you have to be an asshole. His reference was that it's something hardwired into us. If we didn't venerate women back in our Paleolithic days, we never would have survived because you need those to make enough babies to keep the tribe going, right? But he treats, but he's, he, the case he makes, it's like a vestige of uh, of previous, previous uh, environments. So like nowadays, we don't need to venerate women. There's 8 billion of us. We've largely conquered the earth. We're the alpha apex predator. And so now that we have, and now that we're using that same quality as if we're still cavemen fighting for survival, it's actually working against us now. Kind of like how uh, we used to eat simple, simple carbs back in the day because we needed enough calories to hunt. But nowadays we're getting diabetes from it. And he was kind of making the equation that same thing sexually, 
is what we're having like diabetes, like sexual diabetes is what I call it. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I agree. It's like, yeah, it would be nice if they acknowledged it. I just kind of move forward as if just expecting that level of empathy is not reasonable. And so you kind of have to move forward as if you're not going to get it. And I think that's where but I like stuff like when you're, you say it you're the way I just it. said it. Like, like, you know, like a man is half of the relationship. So the man, you know, also matters that he is getting fulfilled by the relationship. No one's like, yeah. no, men shouldn't get fulfilled by their relationship. Like no one says that. Well, no, they won't say that. They'll just they'll just dance around it by all the things that involve like all the things that point to that direction. Everything's wrong with all of those. But of course, we want men to be happy. Just not in any of the ways that, that it actually gets there. There was someone who posted a story, um, but a rip up with a can of chicken soup or something, or that one, like a maybe. There's, there's like a guy, you know, and every day he goes to work in a factory, a grueling day, like 14 hours a day, and his wife doesn't work, and he comes home, and his wife, you know, she can't cook worth a darn, but she's cleaned herself up, she's wearing a dress, her pretty heels, her hair's done nice, smells nice, and she gives him a can of steaming hot chicken soup, and after he's had his chicken soup, Campbell's out of the can, she gives him a blowjob, and they go to bed. And every day, you know, he works for like 14 hours in the freaking factory, but he comes huh. home to like a, a 69 cent can of Campbell's soup, his wife's in a dress, he gets a blowjob. But he's working 14 hours a day in a freaking factory. And, you know, that's like the, the greatest woman there ever was. Like you tell a guy like, you know, <laughs> like, like you tell a guy the story, he's like, my God, I wish my wife was like that. You know, like, I was like well, what would you do if like she had a cold one day? You'd be like, honey, sit down. I will get the soup. You're the greatest wife ever. Like, yeah. you know. But you tell a girl this story, she's like, oh, my God, a blowjob every day with a pig. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, what's that? It's like the idea of being and I think they think of it as submission when it's not really submission. It's, just, it's appreciation. It's in, it's investment. I'd argue investment's the best word for it. The dude's like, like she's you know, actively in, invested in, a, in keeping he, him happy. He's in a factory 14 hours a day. Well, she sits home like a pampered nobility. I mean, like, you know, who's investing in who here? Yeah, well, I mean, everybody's investing, but that's the point, is that the girls see the female investment as in some kind of subservience, like slavery. Actually, fun thing about that, I remember this was an old Purple Pill debate thread. Somebody was asking about this, and Summit girls were actually fairly honest. The one mentioned, uh, I don't know if you remember this, it was a while back, but she loved her dad. Her dad clearly loved her more than mom, and she he gave mom an allowance. You know, how demeaning. She had an allowance as a stay-at-home mom, but mom was happy. But the daughter woke up realizing, like, I would hate to be with a man that I love and have him love my daughter more than me and give me the indignity of that. And so she basically sabotaged and acted like the boss bitch that everybody makes fun of now just because she never wanted to be in that position her mom was in, even though everybody was happy. And it was the weirdest thing. And then the other ones were, uh, and this is mostly, I think it was a black girl where she always complained that she would be terrified of doing the dress and the blowjob and the Campbell soup thing just to have the guy cheat on her and leave anyway. So instead of putting up with that potential risk, she would rather just treat men like garbage for her entire life. It's like a weird self-sabotaging thing. And I've never known how to how to process that other than just to shake my head and think, ah, fucking whamming, you know? You see the parallel to that, and that's like, you know, a lot of red pill guys still like, well, I don't know if I want to invest too much in this woman. Like, they're so petrified of the woman winning that, yeah. like, they don't want to, like, you know, buy her drink on dates or go on dates even. Or, like, you know, God <laughs> forbid, have a relationship. I don't want to invest too much, you know? I mean... Because, you know, if I invest, I lose. What if, like, she doesn't have enough sex or isn't a good enough girlfriend? Like, well, then you break up with her and move on. I guess <laughs> along those lines, you know, I always say, like, you know, these guys don't want to get into a relationship with a woman. I can't commit or I can't invest. But, like, what is a relationship? You're not married, right? Like, what is a relationship? I hmm. verbally promise a girl I will only have sex with her, and she verbally promises me she'll only have sex with me. And if we break that promise, nothing happens. Yeah. Every day you wake <laughs> up and being together is a choice. Yeah. I mean, and There's so no force. If you break that promise and the other person finds out, worst possible consequences, a relationship ends, which you probably weren't that into anyway if you were cheating. And so, like, yeah. these guys are like, I don't want to get into a relationship and commit. Like, I think those guys might be actually, I guess, they're worried about the other women are not going to be dating or putting these hypothetical other women on a pedestal. I don't know. <laughs> well, part of, I know part of it is it's an insecurity thing. And I don't mean it in the way other people do. I mean it in the sense that if she's cheating on you with somebody else, you've lost to that guy. He beat you. He took your woman. And a lot of guys don't like the idea of being a loser in any type of scenario. And then on top of that, it's it's this mommy waifu experience. You know, the ones where they want a girl to love them unconditionally the way mom did, which is kind of it underlies like a complete misunderstanding of the role of women in your life. And I think that's horrible now where everybody thinks your woman has to be your best friend. She has to be your priest. 
She has to be your therapist. She has to act like your mom and cuddle you whenever. And they put like 18 roles on the wife. And the wife's not... Yeah, and she's not equipped for any of them. And she doesn't want any of them. And then is it any wonder that the girl acts horribly because you've put her in this box? And like you said, soup, blowjob, dress. I'm happy. Not one of those things involve her having to be a mommy priest waifu ninja, you know? Yeah, I, my standards of women are actually pretty low. Like, you know, frequent <laughs> sex, don't be a bitch. Like, that's pretty much my only standards for women. And it's it's shocking how few women actually meet those standards. Yeah, shocking. And, and, and I get some the argument they make is that um, they would if they were invested enough, which, fair. Average guy, average girl's not going to be invested in them. That's fine, too. But then, I mean, everybody knows what the rules are of the game now. So isn't that a good thing? Yeah, you understand hard. if she's not invested, she's not going to act like she's invested, and therefore you shouldn't invest yourself. It's hard to get that kind of like investment from a woman nowadays, though. I mean, like, so in between marriages, you know, I start dating, and so I'm dating all these thirty-something single moms, and like, <laughs> oh, that must have been just a dream. Oh, it was just amazing. a dream. It was amazing. <laughs> like, like when you when you actually work out, you're confident, and you're a lawyer and stuff, and you're not fat, and you're not bald. Like, you know, it's it's like shooting fish in a barrel. But then you um. You get on these dates with these women, and every date is terrible because these women just have this dead, glassy-eyed stare as they go through the motions of the date, making the conversation like like <laughs> the and thousand just, cock stare. <laughs> I, I don't know if it's a cock; they just they sit there like they're just staring at you, waiting for you to do or say something interesting. Like they're just they're they're so bored all the time, and like they're like dead inside, and like there's nothing behind the eyes, and like you, you can chisel away. There is a woman in there, but like I guess whatever she's been through, like you know, there's a lot of armor there to. to work your way through and it's just not worth investing that much for a woman you just met and so she's not invested you're not invested you're just you know trying to be your witty charming self and she's giving you those dead eyes and like dating is terrible yeah so that's why i ended up like you know, marrying a woman eight years my junior never married no kids a second time because she still had some life in her eyes and you know, you know glom on it out a little bit take someone who has some life in her yet well still younger is a good thing my girl's eight years younger than me too so i can appreciate it it's just, it's fun. And honestly, I, I've always thought about this. Like when I dated, I enjoyed it, but not because the women were any better back then. I don't think they really were. It's just because I always had more fun with it. I think that's, for me personally, that was my big benefit is I say it's because I had ADHD. And so I'd always entertain myself at other people's expense, which kind of made me an asshole, but it was actually more interesting. But a lot of guys aren't interesting and they are boring. And I could see why girls would get jaded because no guy is interesting. And most girls aren't interesting. So it's not like they can carry it. It's almost like this situation where everybody's miserable and nobody knows how not to be miserable. And then a guy like you comes up, shows them how not to be miserable, and then they don't like you because you didn't say it right. <laughs> it's like, bro, do you, just, do you want to go just die in a ditch somewhere? Like, I can I can give you a good ditch if you need it. Like, yeah, what dating, do you want? It, dating started out fun, but I realized, like, I was spending a lot of time online, like, you know, meet, setting up dates and stuff. It's like, a wait, like I, I got work to do. I got, like, shit to do. I got my kid every other week, and, like, you know, yeah. like, it's a pain in the ass. And it's like, I, I got sick of dating pretty quick. I can see that. In fact, most guys do. A lot of guys say they want to have, like you said, like, 100 girls a year, five days a week, a harem. But it is effort. It is a lot of logistics. I'm seeing guys yeah. do that now, and it's, they've, at best, I see guys two to three girls on rotation is about the most I've seen. Any guy who tries and gets more than that, even some guys at three, they're like, dude, I just want to sit at home in a bathrobe and play modern warfare or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like once you get like a middle age or something in your forties, especially like when you're previously married and you have a kid, like it's just a little cleaner and more respectable to maybe have a consistent casual partner rather than like a rotating stable of women. And especially like, you know, when you have kids who might actually be around your, your women or something. And I don't know. Oh, yeah, that was always the one, too. A lot of guys have always wondered, like, is it when's a good time? Actually, that's a good question for you. When's the good time to introduce the plate to the kids? Or is there one Depends how prior old the to, like, are. marrying or settling down with her? Depends how old the kid is. Yeah. Well, you've got a good range. you got, like, teenager and, like, infant. Well, the infant is with us. I had to introduce yeah, fair. my... <laughs> fair. Yeah. She, she was six when she met um, my wife. Six was a good age. Um. <laughs> I mean, I was pretty sure about this woman then. Like, I know she's going to be around, probably move in. Like, you know, if I'm, I'm, you know, if I'm hooking up with six other girls, I'm not going to introduce my kid to any of them, you know, no yeah. matter what age of my kid. But if there's one girl I'm seeing, been seeing a while, you know, and she's likely to be around, it's probably fine as long as your kid's not like, you know, at the attachment age. Like, I wouldn't do it before six. Like, if your kid's like two to five, I would hold off on that. Oh, the attachment phase. Are you talking about like, you don't, you're worried about the kid kind of like a baby bird attaching to the new character as a mom? 
yeah, I mean, even so, like when she was six, I would like, you know, bring my wife over and, you know, my daughter didn't understand at first as my girlfriend, you know, she's like, you know, she's here to play with me and you're wasting my time with her. I'm like, actually, she's here to play with me and you're wasting my time with her. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't mind. I love you and I'm okay if you spend time with her. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. I know, it's an interesting thing because there's like a lot, that's a lot of problems that people have to deal with now. I know everybody just likes to say single moms are the worst, but if you're a single dad, and like you said, if you're over 30, 32, if you're dating girls at that age, it's going to be impossible to find one that is unless you find a girl, like you said, that's eight years younger prior single to moms also stuff. get it, though. Like if you're a single dad or, you know, you're sharing custody or something like a single mom at least understands having a kid sharing custody, the realities of planning logistics of dates and what it is to be a parent. Whereas, you know, if you try to date a 22 year old who's never had kids, it's a lot harder to have, you know, someone understands what's going on there. Your 22 year old be a little bitchy about some things. And also, um. Single moms, like, you know, a lot of them who are doing well, they've got jobs, they get child support from dad. Like, a lot of them are not looking for a new dad for their kids. Their kids have a dad, and dad's a perfectly decent guy. They're just looking for some fun on the off weeks. And so they usually don't have time to screw around, making you jump through hoops and play games and stuff. They're usually a lot more direct and, um, I guess, I don't Available. Say, fun to be around. Yeah, fun to be around. We'll, we'll, how many euphemisms do you want to use today, sir? I'm all for it. Well, that's the fun thing. It's the Alpha Fox Beta Bucks, isn't it? She's already got everything she needs. Plus, I don't know, is this still a thing in the States? Um, it used to be up here. I don't think it is anymore where alimony or child support, that was until she got remarried. So girls would actively not marry anybody just so they can keep the gravy chain going. Yeah, I think in most states, alimony stops if you remarry. But um, like alimony, at least where I am, they do spouse support's like limited to two years or something. And there's a bunch of constraints on it. So you can get it longer, but there have to be certain things that happen. So I mean, every state is oh. different on that. Oh, fair enough. Like yeah, child closest... support's like perpetual, but like alimony, every state has like laws all over the place on that. Interesting. Because yeah, Canada, it's a weird one. I think we're a lot more regressive than America when it comes to a lot of this stuff. Like in Ontario, where I'm from, where I, where I live right now, they're actually, it's on law that during a divorce, the kids have to maintain, like you cannot decline the kid's lifestyle in any way, which obviously favors if you're a working dad and you have a stay-at-home mom, they're going to have the mom favor custody because the courts hate to change custody. And if she's the one who's already showing that she takes care of the kids. So it's a way of kind of ensuring that no matter what happens when you separate, mom will have a have as close to the same lifestyle and the dad will take all the hits. And it got so bad here that there's cases of guys that are leaving to like non-extradition countries like the Philippines and that because their choice is either to pay their legally mandated spousal support and end up in poverty, like living in a van by the river, or going to somewhere where they can actually hopefully have a good life and essentially abandon their families. It's kind of crazy over That's here. A tough choice. Yeah. And it, yeah, they had an interview with this one guy and it was great. He's like, I love my family, but you know, I cannot keep up the, the pace that I'm working right now to keep them at the lifestyle when I live with them. <laughs> like I can't be homeless and keep my job. They'll fire me. And so he's like, I really had no choice. It was either this or you can go to jail now. Like debtors prisons are back. Remember Magna Carta? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's not dear anymore. If you yeah, don't yeah. pay your child support, they can eventually have you for, I think it's a uh, contempt of court. Well, you're and then while you're in there, in you're still accruing. But you're not going to make any money in there. That's like ludicrous. Yeah, but you know, uh, how do they put it? Uh, David Foley, he's from Kids in the Hall. He's an actor in Canada. He can't come back anymore because for similar reasons like that, the judge actively said your, your obligation to pay is not uh, mitigated by your ability to pay. It was like the most fucked up thing I ever heard. I mean, even like here, they do like your, your child support's a percentage of your salary or something. It's not like, you know, so they do base it a little bit on how much you make. But, and I, I got to say, I lucked out though, you know, with my ex wife, because we got 50 50 custody. She felt guilty about the whole turning gay thing. We had a six year old kid. So, <laughs> oh, so it's mostly amicable, I guess, as amicable as a divorce could be. Yeah. I mean, they were touching on the backpedal and not get divorced anyway. Told me she was bi. And I'm like, look, you know, I, I don't care what you are. You can love whoever you want, but you definitely don't love me. So, you know, like, <laughs> More power to you. I, look, I get it. You're worried about change. You're worried about money. Me too. And, you know, look, I'll be fair with you. But all I care about is, you know, joint custody of our daughter. If you're fair with me on that, I'll be fair with you about the other shit. You know, we'll, we'll be fine. And, you know, she said, I agree. Um, Look, you know, we, we live in Austin. The cost of living is really high. I know 50-50 should be this. I need this much just to pay rent. So if you can't give me this much a month in child support, I'm going to have to go for full custody and get more money from you because it's the only way I can afford to keep living in the same city. If right. you give me this much, I'll give you 50-50 custody. We don't have to fight about anything else. I'm like. All right, blood money, but money well spent. <laughs> Wasn't that the rule? Like, that's why divorce costs so much, because it's worth it? 
Yeah, and, you know, neither one of us was completely happy. Her perhaps a little happier than I am. But you know, I mean, you're down here in Texas, like you know, I mean, we don't have like we have limited spousal support. I don't think she qualifies, but child support is pretty up there in the amount because it is wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Also, ex-wife support. Yeah. And so you're just paying that until the kid's like 26 or something if she's in college. So it's um. I mean, it worked well for you. Like you technically, you took charge of it. You understood the dynamic at play, and you said what it is you wanted, and you had some leverage in that you felt guilty over this, and you just used it. And this is where like a lot of guys get wrong too, because they just hat in hand, like I'm getting divorced. I don't know what to do. How do I make everybody happy? As opposed to you, it's like, like we can go the route where I burn this to the ground, but how about something that makes everybody happy? And you gave her like the easiest choice ever. What do you need for to be happy? And you're like, there, don't touch anything else. Just leave it be. Most guys don't have the peace of mind or like the, the mental point of origin to actually know what it is they want out of a bad situation. It really is a rare thing. As much as you call yourself an average guy, I'd argue not so much, at least not in the ability to separate cleanly. Well, so you know, here's I'm... a compliment for you. Thanks. Now, once <laughs> you started, I'm like, you know, started like trying to get, get us back together or started to get us a counseling or something or trying to backpedal the divorce. I was like, look, um, we've already agreed to these terms. We're already doing this and this. And, um, you know, you're dragging your heels on the divorce. So I'm just going to keep spending money out of our checking account until we run out. If you want half the checking account, you're going to need to stop me and make the divorce final so we can separate it. Because um, if we run out of money, I got a six figure job. I'll be fine. You won't. So you're going to need half of this money. So I would go ahead and actually sign that piece of paper. <laughs> Fair enough. But I mean, that's the thing. A lot of guys are afraid of that. And they've had that where the girl, um, I don't want to, again, it's, it's mostly private community stuff. So I like kind of keeping it anonymous, but they get separated because the girl found a new man that she was cheating on that she thinks is going to be great. That kind of falls through for some reason or they get into a fight that she kind of comes back because she's scared about being alone. It's like, well, maybe we should give it another shot. And it's very tempting for a guy who has divorce dumped on his lap, right? To say, okay, let's give it another shot. But it's not, it's not that she wants them back. It's that she, she's missing her soft landing. And so she wants, she's buying time. Like she may feel it. She may believe it. She may even do hysteric bonding. I don't know if you remember when we had those uh, field reports that were coming out there for like a two year period about hysteric bonding. Do you remember these? Oh Probably yeah. Not. It's so that oh everything's great because we're having sex every five minutes. Like, no, dude. Yeah, no, <laughs> dude. <brace> yourself. <laughs> yeah. This is a fight or flight response. It will go away. Yeah. Radical changes in personality are actually kind of a warning sign for a variety of issues. Yeah. But but, but that's the point. You kind of like, you know, you stuck to your guns. You realize like once it's over, it's over. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be scared about because there's like you said, there's uncertainty about it, right? I mean, I knew I'd be fine. I already started dating. I knew I had a six-figure salary. And if there's one thing that's more expensive than divorce, it's marriage. <laughs> like, you know, when your wife doesn't make a lot of money, she's spending your shit. Like, Amazon boxes arrive at your house every five minutes. And, like, Nick Nash from Pottery Barn. Like, your wife yeah. is spending into oblivion on shit you don't need. Like, marriage is more expensive than divorce in most cases. I mean, if, like, Jeff Bezos or something, maybe divorce is more expensive. But generally, marriage is more expensive. Dude, most guys find that out. That's the funniest thing I ever find when you hear about guys getting divorced. And they're like, oh, I have to pay this, I have to pay this, I have to pay this. And then they look at their disposable income at the end of the month. They're like, holy shit, I'm going to go fuck a 20-year-old. This is great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was still spending myself in oblivion. Because I had, like, you know, unmortgaged a house and, you know, get a whole bunch of, like, loans taken out to pay my wife her half of the equity. So I ended up with the biggest loan I've ever had in my life on just my salary. So that was a bit of a pain in the ass. But part of our agreement is I keep my you know, our kid in the school district. So, you know, so I just kept the house and, you know. Everyone in the neighborhood, man, they thought, like, you know, this guy must be a genius or something. Like, you know, everyone knows the wife gets the house, the wife gets the kids, the wife gets all the money, and the husband lives in a bad part of town and shoots himself. And so, you know, <laughs> like, I'm sitting here, like, I'm still living in suburbia in, like, a four-bedroom house, you know, getting my daughter every other week. And they're like, he must have done something really awful, or she did. Yeah, it's not even that. It's just, And this is the part that sucks so much, because that's, they cannot picture you doing something for your own, like, any guy doing something for their own best interest deliberately systematically not worrying about feelings and that not worrying about walking on eggshells just no this is what's best for me and the people under my care you know your family and i'm just gonna do it and then you do it and you do it well and it tends to work out well because as a guy you're fucking competent you know what you're doing but you see what i mean like you said like every one of your neighbors is like dude somebody must have been doing crack for this to happen like it's it's fucking magical you said across society though like um i don't know it's been a modern push like i guess acting in your own self-interest is like wrong or something like people are supposed to vote against their self-interest people are supposed to advocate for viewpoints against their self-interest like oh. i just think what is good for me and for my family what gets us ahead hell even at the expense of others you know i'll kill a million strangers and it makes my family's life better they're strangers what the fuck do i care and yeah. everyone used to think like this and now, like, if you think like this, you're the world's most evil human. Like, I'm going to prioritize me and my family. 
Like that's like some kind of radical viewpoint now. I, I honestly don't understand it myself other than the only thing that makes any sense to me is that life is so good for so many people that it's almost a flex showing you could vote against your best interest and still be well off. But the problem with that is I call it the spinners on your rims dilemma where people who wouldn't be better off pretend to be better off so that they can look better like a signaling theory thing. My joke from that, like the spinning rims being, if you want to be a rich guy, you can either make a bunch of money or you can pretend to make a bunch of money by buying a big G chain and putting spinners on your rims. And I argue most people now are doing that to buy spinners for their rims. That's also a sign times are maybe a little too easy and too decadent. Like, you know, when, when, when nobody's starving and everyone can make it to work safely without getting shot. And like, you know, yeah. even if you work a regular job, like if nobody's hungry yet, then we have too much free time on our plates to have, you know, stupid ideas and get ideology wars and stuff. Like once like, you know, people actually get hungry and they start shooting each other, then all this goes out the window. Oh, fair enough. So in other words, when the next Republicans in office, <laughs> maybe <laughs> I'm not going into politics. I'm not. I just thought it was I got I followed the whole Black Lives Matter riot thing. And Twitter was pretty funny on that one. Everybody had a great take. Great take. Yeah, right in the middle of COVID, too. That was funny. Yeah. Right. Turn the middle. <laughs> you cannot leave your house for any reason except for rioting against the white man. No, at least you guys had it better. Like, I don't know. I Texas was pretty much like, fuck it. Just do what you do. Right. They didn't have lockdowns or anything. Uh, a little bit. I mean, you know, especially in Austin, because, you know, like the, the county judges here and all that. I mean, Austin's like California, but in Texas. And so we uh, had a little bit of that going on. Like um, we had like protests in Austin about all kinds of stuff. And the, the mayor of Austin was like, you know, oh, well, I'm happy everyone's out here burning buildings down because they're wearing masks. Like, you know, it was, it was dumb fuckery. <laughs> Jesus. But, um, you know, most of Texas, yeah, I mean, we, we usually live and let live. We, we back down from the crazy COVID stuff earlier than most other states. And, you know. Yeah, it's Sounds like that's where we're going after Ontario. We had a bad here. We had a really yeah. bad. They shut yeah. down stores. Everything was basically shut down except for weed dispensaries, liquor stores, and grocery stores for about two years. No gym for two years. It's the longest I've ever gone in my life without a workout. We had to buy, and like just buying, you know, the, the, the weights you buy that have the little clicker on them that you can switch between 20 to 50 pounds? Those like power blocks, they were running for like a thousand dollars for two fifty pound oh, yeah. sets. I looked at some workout gear at Amazon for like this when our gyms were closed. I'm like, this is like way too free. I ended up borrowing some weights from like a friend down the street who had heavier weights than I did. But yeah, that was a that was a rough patch there. But yeah, it was a strange time because you see like like Canada, for example, you think like Australia, westernized countries are like going all psycho on this. Like I had stories like Australia they were locking people in apartments or something for quarantine and like going through their groceries and taking the alcohol out because they were getting too unruly if they were drinking too much. And Yeah, it's, great, it was a lot of shit. insanity like that. A poor bastard just had a barbecue joint. They basically ran him out of the country. It was the weirdest thing. But, and then this is kind of and it's tying it back to the sexual dynamics married red pill side. It was weird because up here I noticed there was like a, a general shift in people where, and I think this is a good thing, where people just stop caring. It's like a big demoralization. They just stop giving a fuck. And I did notice the uptick in guys that started you know, fuck it. I'm just going to do my own thing now, which I mean, for the single guys, it sucks because now they're not fucking. But for the married guys, they started acting a little more selfish in a good way. So I think you're on to something with that whole as long as everybody's fed and nothing's going wrong, people tend to do stupid things. But once things get a little more desperate and all it took was like a little manufactured desperation. Don't leave the house, you son of a bitch. I imagine a dating scene, though, during the lockdown had to have been, you know, shitty. Like, I was, you know, had a good force if I'd already met my wife to be, you know, so we were doing fine. But, yeah, um, if you were, like, trying to like, hook up on Tinder during the middle of a pandemic, that probably didn't go so well. Oh, it's 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 good now because people still wear masks. And it's almost like, you know how there's always those paranoid people that uh, they need to clean doorknobs before they touch them? Like, that kind of OCD-free cleanliness thing? They were always there, and there was always a concern of one crazy person. But now it's like there's a uniform for it. So it's getting much easier for people to tell the difference between how chill or not chill a person they're dealing with. So it, it's, it's not all bad, I guess. All things Maybe. considered, I'd rather be in Texas. Let's spot the hysterics, you know, when they come in the gym and wearing a mask or something. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, oh, dude, I almost killed a guy. They finally opened the gyms again after it was like 18 months since the last time they opened it. And this guy was in there with a mask freaking out because of somebody else. And I almost fucking, I almost threw my 10 pound weight at his face. I feel uh, bad. Luckily, security came in there and kind of dealt with him. But when gyms first started reopening, we were traveling to Florida and like um, I was like visiting this gym or something. I got a guest pass for the week and because like, yeah, my yeah. wife has a friend's there. And so like, um, 
like so I, I'm going to work out and I come around like you have to wear your mask while you're working out like so not just in between like while I'm doing squats the mask on my face like oh yeah. Jesus Christ we I know it's stupid but we have to come around every five minutes make sure everyone's doing it because there are people who don't think the gym should be open at all and they're calling with fake mask reports and the cops are coming to check us out so we have to be Nazis about this I'm like well shit <laughs> Yeah, I want to get you guys clothes. Yeah, so I mean, there are people just calling in fake reports. We're calling corporate, calling the police on them and stuff. So they got like you know be mass Nazis at the gym. Yeah, those people, the H O, they they run the H O A S in their local area, but that's not enough power. They need to get the mass thing too. Freaks the hell out of me. Well, and, and that's and I get it too from a company perspective why they have to because you don't want to have the risk of getting a fine and all that, especially if like for a condo like our gym is in our condo. So ideally, we don't want the whole building sued. That would cost us all money. So we have to play it safe. I get that, and I guess. I know back to the the sexual dynamics like there's a place for risk and there's a place for not risk i think a lot of guys have very bad ability to manage risk it's like you said with the divorce situation you took calculated risks during the COVID situation sometimes you had to take a, a more risk averse policy because you know the legal ramifications of it whatever I, I just don't find guys to be very good at it and i do you notice this as well guys are really just out of whack on what's a good risk and what's a bad risk like they'll wipe up a stripper but they won't bother investing in their Roth IRA. <laughs> Examples. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know much about American investing. Yeah, guys are hesitant to spend money and easy about wiping up strippers, but they don't realize is indirectly spending money. It is funny. Maybe <laughs> just they don't understand. Maybe they don't understand economics or something. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Anyways, here we're gonna do one more uh, ad, and then we'll do some banter. Which one do we want to no, use? We're oh, not bantering now. What is this? It's, well, this is this is on point, but it's going to be banter next. All right, hey, brother, who do you think is the funniest member of Rule Zero Squad? Now, it's your favorite comment joke of theirs. I think Ryan brings good laughs. He does. <laughs> Ryan is like British humor. It's like Monty Python. <laughs> People are like, and if you get it, you laugh your ass off. If you don't get it, you're like. Fuck <laughs> Ryan. People just don't get his humor. Who's the funniest one on there? You mean besides John Fitch? <laughs> I think John Fitch is the funniest member of Rule Zero, but he's unintentionally funny. With the robot dogs. The same this robot dog in real life was pretty surreal and terrible. <laughs> yeah, Cappy's pretty funny. He can be pretty funny, too. Who's the funniest member? All that because Rolo said I wasn't funny. That's son of a bitch. That's fucking hilarious. Uh, maybe you're not funny. No, no, it's fine. It's whatever. It's good. It's good humor. So here's my, I don't know, I just wanted to banter. Like, what what do you remember about the old times in the Married Red Pill? I don't really, t like, Wine More Please, Rule Zero Dad, and you now are, like, the only three guys from that time I talked to. I don't know. I don't remember it that much. I mean, like, it was seven to ten years ago, and I remember I was, you know, I had a good time reading Reddit and getting my dopamine and seeing all the upvotes and comments. The comments were actually more fun than the upvotes because, you know, such people who, like, had critical things to say because, A, it made me think, and B, it, you know, Reminded me that I'm smarter than a lot of people out there. So Reddit was a good <laughs> dopamine hit, but I mean, look, I don't remember it all that much. It wasn't like a you know a formative part of my existence. I was in a bad marriage with a woman who turned out to be gay, and you know, I I did the work. I you know I'm a, I'm a skinny fuck, but I'm you know you can tell I go to a gym when I take my shirt off, and I have a new wife and a one year old. And hmm. Life's pretty good. No, it's interesting. Yeah, I'm just surprised you didn't get to, to get, learn a lot more of the people around there because. I did notice that you could always tell who was going to have something good to say and who was not. I found the best ones were ones that were speaking from personal experience and the not so good ones were the ones that kept trying to theorize and build like a moral worldview out of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's like, again, it's, that's why I loved your stuff. The, the mental masturbation, the academic thinkers, you know, want to come up with like, you know, why is this happening? Here's my theory on, you know, what the, okay. people who come on like, you know, like what frame means to me or something like, you know, the wise. <laughs> You're wasting my time, man. You're wasting the internet's bandwidth. Like, you know, people have to, like, Reddit's paying, like, AWS or something to host that. Like, you're, you're killing Reddit, man. <laughs> Nowadays, though, I guess that's the new thing. They're trying to do that again, but it doesn't really matter. Reddit's such shit now. I'm still surprised that we never got the boot after a while. That like, is, is that strange. the point that like, misogyny is, like, a bannable offense? Yeah, I, I don't understand that. I mean, I had this whole, like, a fiasco with a quarantine site, which, you know, just means that you have to look for it rather than it shows up and you don't even have to put up with ads or something. So even better. I, I don't know. Yeah. Well, I've tried that for a while. For my first book, I was like, you know what? I should do like an advertising campaign on there. They don't actually let you advertise on individual subreddits. They have to, they give you like approved list of things. So if you wanted to write Married Red Pill, the book, and advertise it on the Red Pill, they wouldn't let you, even before it was quarantined. So they just had really, really horrible things. And each one had to be approved by an individual. Like there was no automated system like Google or Twitter or Amazon would have. But they really are run by retards. I don't know how else to explain it. 
I don't know how they're still in business, but yeah, I mean, everyone's on Twitter nowadays anyway, and, and even that's going to be replaced by whatever the next thing is once, you know, something cooler than Twitter comes out. Like, it, everything changes every five minutes. Like, you know, yeah. when people started dating on Instagram, that was weird as shit to me, because, like, Instagram was supposed to where you post pictures and stuff. You know, every you know, wife and girlfriend I know was posting pictures about, like, you know, their activities. Now suddenly everyone's, like, sliding in the DMs and using Instagram mm-hmm. as a dating platform. And I guess... Dude, Twitter's a dating platform. I've, I've, like, people are finding people to fuck on there. It's the craziest thing. Well, I guess, you know, if there's a way to turn something into sex, humanity will find a way, but yeah. Sex That's terrifying. <laughs> Imagine that you work, you build your brand, you have your, your law firm or whatever on Twitter, and then you like treat a girl on a date wrong. She puts your account on blast. I was like, ah, I don't cool. know. The risk for me just isn't worth free publicity. <laughs> yeah. Free publicity. Look at this alpha male. The women's mad at him. <laughs> Sign him up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't remember, like, you know, who's who of the red pill, because a lot of times I'm just reading content. Is it interesting to read or not? I'm not looking at who posts it. Sometimes I'll get through halfway through and, like, this sounds a lot like that guy, and I'll check the name. But, I mean, like, I don't remember who's who. Like, I've never met any of these people in the real world. I probably never will. And, you know, I don't know anything about their personal lives. So it's hard to kind of commit their internet identity to my memory and, you know, associate them with anything. Fair enough. Maybe that's my version of autism, I guess. But it was good. That's why I liked because uh, it was yeah the big ones I remember. There was you, there was Jack Ten of Hearts, who was uh he's a marketer, did some psychology and marketing, which he I liked his takes. They were similar to yours, but he kind of framed things in a marketing standpoint. There's Rule Zero Dad, who I've, we've met and we've talked. He's a pretty good guy. You'd like him. Another lawyer, uh, uh Taipan Shim Sham, or you might call him S Curve much. He was a doctor. Same thing. He was basically the the Beta Bucks guy who realized that his wife was just kind of with him because he was a good pick on paper but not in real life and so he kind of ditched it to start dating 20 year olds again and had way more fun with it ultimate cad which was literally your situation if you had stuck together with your wife and then just decided to go sleep with every girl in the neighborhood instead but i liked it because it was everybody had a story and just by listening to the field reports you could learn the stories and the stories would they'd illuminate you on where it's coming from because like cad story about him opening up his marriage, cheating on his wife. I got to take that, like a lot of his advice from that perspective. That's not what I want to do with my marriage. So I probably won't apply it, but I would use it. Like his greatest example was, um, he was talking about how for all the women he was, they were cheating on their husbands with him. They would call their husband, you know, cause call me if you're out late. Okay. Let me know. And she's calls, you know, kiss your wife and all that stuff. And then hang up the phone and start blowing them. And it was, it was revealing that he could just tell you like, look, if she's cheating on you, you'll never know. So don't try to hide a GPS tracker in your chick's car and like that. Just you'll know when her behavior changes and just act accordingly. Or yours too. Like I knew you were pissed off at the wife. I never knew why at the time. So it's kind of neat to know now. I always just find it gave the context, but maybe that's me. Maybe I just like the human aspect of this stuff. I, don't know. I always said that, you know, I mean, when you trust someone, cheating and getting away with it's really easy. And so I mean, if your wife wants to cheat on you and get away with it, I mean, it's not like it's hard. I mean, especially if you trust her. And so... I'd always tell guys like, you know, your wife, your girlfriend, maybe she's cheating on you, maybe she's not. But I mean, if she's cheating on you, you're not going to know it unless she fucks up or wants you to find out. So lying in bed awake at night, biting your nails, wondering about that stuff, stressing out about it when, you know, you're not going to know anyway. You might as well just go to the gym in the morning, get a good night's sleep and you know worry about that shit if she fucks up or something. Yeah, dude, exactly. And and everybody will fuck up eventually. Isn't that how criminals always get caught is because they get too cocky if they're not caught for a length of time and start making stupid mistakes? Yeah, like if you're constantly suspicious, that's when she's going to start like keeping her phone close and like hiding her shit and deleting messages. Like you're going to make her more careful. And, you know, it's not like you need to like be super super try to catch someone. I mean, if she's cheating on you, she'll fuck up eventually. But there's no sense lying awake stressing out about things you will never know and can't help. Yeah. A lot of guys do, though. They're terrified of that. They want, I need a shopping list of what what to look for when your woman's sleeping with somebody else. And it's like, there's no, I've never been able to give an answer. There's this guy, Donovan Sharp, in here. He was always talking about how he put, a GPS tracker in his chick's car. And I know you won't remember this, but it was an old married red pill one. I can't remember who it was, but he talked with like, all of us were kind of piling on him on this. We're like, look, you're just moving the goalposts. Like he was expecting her to be cheating on him. And so any evidence he got that she wasn't, it was because she was clever and hit it. Like, Oh, she said she was parked at the grocery store for 30 minutes. Well, she would have parked it there and then walked across the street, caught the bus to his place and come back. It's like, nothing was ever good enough. It was just crazy how it had this like paranoia spiral. Yeah, and there's no um, question on that. I was just ranting and hoping you can rant back. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I agree. That is very stupid. I mean, you, you want like a more in-depth rant? Like that was stupid because? 
Yeah. Well, I mean, the emotion. The guys are emotionally attached to it, and he's terrified of losing things, right? I think that's most of it. Is a lot of this was just self therapy for guys. Like, how do you how do you cope with these concerns you have, or how do you shed them from your mind? I think it's like more was, than just a how to list. It's... Like I was saying earlier, you know, I mean, like these are generally good guys who work hard, bring home money, and treat their women okay, and you know don't deserve to be in situations where she's not fucking him or don't deserve the situations where she's mean to him or, you know, where that behavior of hers leads them to think maybe she's cheating. Like, I mean, you know, those guys are generally good guys and it's, you know, life's not fair. They're in that position and feeling that way. Like when you wake up every morning, you feel that way. It's like weighing on your soul. Like it's hard. Yeah. So, I mean, some guys manifest that, I guess, by getting angry on the internet. Some, I guess, by planting GPS trackers and Inventing stories in their minds about what's going on. <laughs> Everyone tries to cope in different ways. And in his mind, he needed her to be the bad guy because he didn't deserve, you know, to be in that situation. He's a good guy, works hard, provides for his family, loves his wife, really just yeah. wants things to be good with her. And so he's in that situation. So in his world, she has to be the bad guy. If she's just also a good guy who is not attracted to him, like that's a lot harder to swallow. Well, yeah, because that means there's something fundamentally wrong with him on an, on like a, an, an individual or not, level just, just wrong with them i mean you know not every girl's into every guy i mean you know and maybe she married the wrong guy and she was never died into him or maybe her her taste changed i mean things happen it's not always the guy's fault i mean maybe there's oh, something no, he could have done maybe there's nothing he could have done but i mean you know if, he, if he's backslidden he gained 200 pounds sure maybe she should try losing at least half of that but you know otherwise you know maybe it's just her i'm with you i'm with you on that like fault it's for women and children to worry about i've never I found that most guys do far better when they just stop worrying about who's to blame and who's at fault and just like, where's my optimal solution out of where I am right now? Yeah, I mean, there are guys who like, I don't know, they get to this like hyper analytical stage where maybe if I'd done this differently, maybe I can do this differently next time. You know, they, they think they can control the universe with their behavior. Yeah. When really, it's, you know, just think more about, you know, yourself. Who are you? What do you want out of life? What can you do to get to that point? And when you just act like, you know, what, what, what would our twinger do today? Like, you know, just do what I want to do to get to my next place. I don't have to think so hard about like trying to manipulate the universe. I don't know. Dude, when you, you make when it sound so easy. When you're you just know how hard that with is yourself. to get guys just, there? Well, most guys, most people don't know what they want or who they are, especially younger guys in their 20s. They're still figuring that shit out. And so, I mean, yeah. their life is defined by their relationships with girls because they, they haven't grown up yet. They're still figuring out who they are, what they want, where they're going in the universe. And so a lot of times your relationship at a young age are you figuring out about yourself and the relationship is one of the tools you use to do that, which is why people don't need to be investing so much in those relationships when you're in your early 20s because you're still learning about yourself. That relationship really is practice. Like, you're supposed to be having sex more often than once a month, but you, really, you're <laughs> learning about yourself. And like, I don't know, when you're 30 something, 40 something, well, eventually you hit a point where you're pretty comfortable in who you are. You've done enough. You know what you want out of the universe. Then you can just be that guy. And, you know, relationships will come and go because some will fit what you want, some won't. Yeah. I suppose so. It's the weirdest thing, though, now. And I think it's just because it's the demographic of guys who find their way here. I'm seeing a lot of guys in their mid 30s and older who still haven't figured it out. And I don't know if it's like a, a case of delayed adolescence because Could everything be. is so easy. You don't have to grow up that people are like putting it off and putting it off. But it is weird because like you are definitely like I'm assuming you're Gen X. Yeah. It's just like a different generation. It's just not the same. Like I'm like one of the older millennials, but you watch millennials now and it's at the point that they're getting mad at Barbie because it's not masculine enough. It's like, what the fuck? <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, when you, you follow the college, the grad school, the job to, you know, get a wife to, you know, be in a marriage or in a relationship in a certain way, like, I guess you're, you're not really at a point where you've ever had to even stop and ask the question, you know, what do I want? Who am I? Like, you know, you're going through school because you're supposed to, you get a job because you're supposed to, you need money. You married a woman and treat her well because you're supposed to, you're supposed to, you know, be yeah. the family guy and be good to your woman. And so you spend all this time doing what you're supposed to do. And you've never really stopped to even ask, what do I want? So like you're 36 and you I have no freaking clue who you are because you've never even asked a question. Dude, guys free. I have never, like I've asked probably a hundred guys that question. We've had to do consults or group stuff or whatever. Not one guy has ever had an answer for that. One guy broke down, broke down in tears because he was talking about like just explaining the situation with his, in his case, it was his wife was cheating on him and then she wanted a divorce and he wanted to know how to win her back. And then just the process of him articulating that and me asking him what he wanted, he started crying in front of me. It was, the, it was the most awkward thing ever. Like, I've done it before in the military, but, like, you say this stuff like it's so easy and matter of fact. And this is kind of why I cheerlead your stuff so goddamn much. is because what you just put in a in a three-paragraph essay about knowing what you want, most guys having to spend, like, a year 
because they just never had to ask and they're terrified that their mom or their dad or their girl will think poorly of them and think of them as some kind of bad guy as opposed to just embracing that not everybody is going to like who the new me is and that's okay as long as i'm good with it like the male species has forgotten that we're people too and that we matter like i, I don't know like it's, it's okay to like have hopes and aspirations and dreams and act to make those happen no, 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 no. That can't be right. Sometimes sometimes even to the detriment of other people. Like sometimes you might do something that fulfills what you want that is suboptimal for another human, and that is okay. Yeah. Again, it'll take – I've seen it take guys like a year just to accept that simple statement you put out there. So like I, re, I know when you speak of it matter-of-factly, I know you're kind of – you acknowledge it does happen, but – yeah, it's 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 something else. This is why I got to admit, if you ever decide to leave law and come into this space, it'll be one of those moments you have where you're like, holy shit, maybe I am awesome. Like when you call yourself average, I really don't think that's the case. Well, I'm happy to come on shows more often. No one ever has me on a second time because I'm boring. I shoot the shit with people about like personal anecdotes and people want like Arts Winger's top 10 list of why women suck ass or something, you know? Ah, no, no, or no. top list of how to get women to suck your ass. You know what we'll do? We'll get you, me, and Rule Zero Dad together. Start talking about the old stuff. You'll like him. It'll be like two lawyers and an idiot talking together. You're a lawyer? No, he is. I'm an ex sailor know. information security. I was the top secret communications guy. Just my whole job is to keep my mouth shut. That's why I'm so awkward at this. Oh, you do good. <laughs> Thanks, sir. All right, so we're coming at the end. This is normally the part where I ask guys, like, you know, if people want to read more about you and reach you, but I don't think you really, like, do you want to be out there and known? Did you start a Substack? Do you have a Twitter you want people to follow even? Or. You just want me to continue cheerleading your stuff. Oh, no, I wish I started Twitter. Like, I, I don't want people to find me in the real world, but, you know, <laughs> I, got, I got like a day job. It takes so much time to post like Manosphere content. Yeah, oh, I don't blame you. It's not it's not fun. It's like I said, if it didn't if it didn't pay well, but at least I don't have to take a two hour commute every day. That's the big benefit for me. Well, I guess then for everybody else, you can always find Archwinger stuff on on Reddit. You just look for Archwinger or TRP dot red. Same name. Most of your stuff is on there. I think your your blog on there was called The Asshole. It's oh, probably one of that my favorites. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I said, the last update you did was about six years ago, so it's a lot of old stuff. I would be curious if you ever decided to start putting stuff out there again, like how the last six years has kind of updated and changed your thoughts, because most guys are, are gone in the wind. They've disappeared. You've never seen them again. You're one of the few that are still around after all this. And well, I was only always barely around. The... I disappeared for six years, didn't I? But yeah. Yeah, but the fact that you're even available at this point is like an unheard of thing. And so there's always the cases you wonder, like, did this does the stuff still hold up in the guy's life who wrote it? Like, do you think you did? Like, for all the stuff that you've kind of had in your old stuff from what you can remember, you're like, is it more of, you know, that helped me get through that time? Or is it kind of like, no, I, it's still pretty, pretty good now. even mix of both. I mean, there are some universal truths that are always the case. And then there are some things where, like, you know, looking back, there's a lot of stuff I was really like, like most guys, they blame women for a lot of shit. Most of these guys are just kind of mad at themselves. Like, you know, you, you spent your whole life believing a certain thing, playing the wrong rules or the wrong game, didn't focus on the right stuff. And, yeah, you know, so you spent a, a period of your life being unfuckable. Meanwhile, all the girls you were pining after were having all the sex they wanted. And, you know, and so you get angry just... at women, like, <laughs> like they've denied something to you. They put you through that when really you're mad at yourself. You put yourself through that. You made choices. Based on the information you had at the time, that you know were not the optimal choices for getting what you wanted, and you know that's on you. And you have to come to grips with that. You have to realize you were—I don't want to say at fault, but I mean you were the source of the consequences that happened in your life. And then, big part here, you have to forgive yourself for being that guy who uh -huh. didn't get it. You know, playing the wrong game, wrong rules. Like you have to, you know, forgive that guy for being that guy. Got to where you are and be ready to move forward. So you can let it go and stop being mad at yourself. And I guess women is a, a, a vest to avoid being mad at yourself then you know you're going to be embroiled in that kind of battle of self-hate woman hate but once you can forgive yourself for you know being that guy who didn't get it then you can move on i like that you know what that's a wholesome message i think we're going to end it on that All stick right. around after this we'll probably do some unwinding talk but i gotta do my outro i don't usually post pictures of my kids online but they're infants and you can barely see them so you know it's it's fine but a YouTuber named Ryan Stone, named Ryan Stone, named Ryan Stone, tweeted, showing off the F trophies for clout. <laughs> so the babies are trophies that I'm showing off. It's perhaps not a surprise that a picture of a proud father would be so upsetting to the sort of man who clearly never had one. Twenty-four fifty-eight learning, learning Corp. Little Red Riding Hood, take one. Uh -huh.